born in 1966. He turned his life around. He wasn't doing so hot. He got rid of that weight and he gained a lot of wisdom. He lives in a tent. Thank you all so much for playing along. And I hope you have a wonderful night. And I'd like to welcome to the stage, Mr. Hey everybody, welcome to Roll On, where after a few minutes off, a non-voluntary COVID-induced free speech impinging mini sabbatical, the boys are finally back. And once again, in the seat across from me, we find the hooch to my Turner, the Isles to my Rizzoli, <laughs> the Murtog to my Riggs, the chef to my chef, inside joke for all you fans of the bear. We're gonna get into that later. Uh, the literary lion himself, Mr. Adam Skolnick. And today, as is our want, we bring a fresh perspective on sports, art, culture, world events, try to make a little more sense of this insane world we all inhabit and uh, have a few laughs along the way. So today we got a bit of catching up to do because how many weeks has it been since we've done this? I, I feel rusty. Yeah, you feel rusty? I do. When's the last time you were in the, that, that captain's seat? You mean doing a podcast? Yeah. Oh, last week. Oh. Just not with you. I'm rusty oh. with you. We have to we have I feel to, like our, you're right. Our it's, relationship has to get in sync. It's gonna be like you know? a couple that has like we haven't talked in a bit. Yeah. <laughs> hasn't, you know. <laughs> right. And then the first time back, it's like, you know, but I think we're doing okay. I think we'll hit our stride. Yeah. So yeah, today we got some interesting stories from the world of athletics and ultra running, as usual. We share a few things we've been enjoying respectively. Uh Based on the outline in front of me, yes. which I'm willing to toss out the window and just free will if you want, uh, but I'd characterize what we've kind of thought about talking about today as, as, a, as, a, as a pretty classic version of roll-on, an old school roll-on, if it can be old school. Yeah, a, a retro, <laughs> a retro roll-on. <laughs> Have we been doing it long enough that we can do vintage It's roll a vintage at this roll-on. Point? It's Let's see. Let's see if what see what the listening public has to say. I don't say. know. Anyway, well, they were concerned. I was getting messages saying, "Where's Rollon? Are you? Did something happen? Did you got? Are you guys in a fight? Is that the? Did you stoke that that theory? That conspiracy theory? I, I, I sprinkled it. I, I yeah. have a Reddit thread that you're I did not aware tweet of. out that I had COVID and we were going to have to take oh, a break. That's right. um, but you know, not everyone's on Twitter. So well, I mean, I think we should. One thing we should dispense with. Before we get into the Adam check-in, mm -hmm. tell me, tell us how you're feeling. COVID for the second time in what, six weeks? Why don't you check in first and we'll get into it. Okay. I'm happy to share about it. All right. Well, I'm excited to announce my new career. I've I tendered my resignation at Ben & Jerry's. Is that is that shirt part of the uniform for whatever this new career is? No, it's just a shirt. <laughs> <laughs> but That might be the most Skolnickian shirt I've ever seen you wear. <laughs> there you go. It's a Skolnickian by way of Patagonia. But I've been spending the last several weeks while um, when you haven't been nurturing my calls, just really connected to the LA Sheriff's Department where I've been training as a driver's license revocator. Uh -huh. And so what that means is I've been deputized with the power that if you flout the rules of the road in front of me, I can and will revoke your license on the spot. So that means if you cut me off by changing lanes or turning late onto the road right in front of me and then immediately hit your brakes, by the time you get home, you will no longer be a licensed driver. Are you feeling disempowered in your life? No, I'm just where saying- is if, this, Where if, is this impulse coming if from? If you run a four-way stop while I'm running while pushing a stroller, no more license for you. That's where this comes from. Right. So I'm just trying to play this out, like yeah. the practicalities of it. So you're yes. going to chase this guy down and potentially get into I, a physical no. altercation? No, no, no. I just get that license number, the license plate. And then we do, we work all the little ring cameras. There's an algorithm that I work. All the ring cameras that I can find, all the public cameras. We get the driver's face recognition. 
and immediately I can do it virtually. That's how good I am. That's how, that's what this training is all about. How much time have you invested in this fantasy? Fantasy? This is a real thing. <laughs> yeah, okay. If I see you creeping along the road at rush hour traffic with a long line of cars behind you and you're looking for a parking space for you, I will issue a warning. And and if it doesn't happen again, that's What are you fine. supposed to do if you're looking for a parking spot? Listen, I'm tough, but fair. Is my you, need point. To, you need to slow down to find that spot. I know, but there's ways of doing it, Rich. You know, we're in this together. We're, this, is a, this is a team game. Well, I might need to deploy your services okay. because uh, my eldest daughter, Mathis, she just got her driver's license and yeah. she's been driving around for all of 10, day, 10 days at this point <laughs> as a newly minted licensed driver. Yeah. And she already got her first moving violation. Really? So in that case, assuming your, your, your you know, temperance for fairness, yeah. would you revoke Absolutely not. I might First ask of all, you. I might ask you to revoke. I'm not license. against. I'm not against speeding. <laughs> speeding has its time and place. I, I'm not going to revoke a license over mere speeding. Okay. Um, it's really more about the uh, kind of the, the driver that doesn't is not aware of the of the rules, not the one that f- that flouts the rules for a specific. Mm, so what's? I'm still trying to get at what's behind this. This uh, are you are you this saying irritation you, with people that don't follow the rules? It's not basically. really that. It's, it's, what is the it's temperament? My irritation with people who can't drive. Mm. That's what my well, you, irritation. You live is. in the wrong state. You should move to you know. <laughs> See, you're move you're, to Germany or something. You're you're at that zone two heartbeat. Like if if you see an idiot driver out there, that doesn't bother you. Oh, uh, I get my I get I get ruffled. Okay, from time to time. That's all I'm saying. Yeah. I know what that's like. But I heard that when you were at the driver's, at this DMV getting Mathis her license, where she got it herself, she passed the test. Yeah. I had you a ran ce- into a friend of mine. I had a celebrity encounter at the DMV. <laughs> Who was in it? Thousand Oaks. Uh, your buddy, the, the, the Malibu artist. Carlos. Malibu artist. How was that? Was it a funny His name comes up with more regularity on this podcast than most people. I know. He's doing great work. You know, he was just in Florida or maybe he's still there but he was um, working in Jupiter, out of Jupiter, Florida. He was reporting on a shark fishing tournament mm. um, where there's this, it's, it's a sanctioned tournament. Noah has given permits to these boats. There were 57 boats in the competition, apparently. Um, only 12 came to weigh in. 11 bull sharks were taken. And it's a tournament that claims to support conservation science. And they claim that hundreds of sharks were tagged on a catch and release basis, but undercover footage has since emerged with tournament organizers saying, suggesting to the fishermen to kill as many sharks as possible and don't dispose the bodies, don't just take the jaws and toss them over um, because divers will go looking for them and they're afraid of the environmentalists to you know, sensationalize things. But the fact of the matter is um, no evidence of tag data registration has emerged from this competition. There's no videos of tag and release that have been put forward by the organizers. Um, fishermen often do participate in science, um, but there's no evidence that that happened here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so, you know, personally, I have no vendetta against fishermen. I respect anybody who dedicates their life to being on the water. Um, I don't respect the, you know, sport hunting of beasts like, uh, you know, sharks at all. You know? Just out of curiosity, yeah. how would you steel man the support conservation science argument behind this? Like, what is that argument? Their argument was that they were tagging sharks and then they were releasing them. So then the tags, you know, shark scientists can then theoretically track migration patterns and you can right. learn about shark behavior. But in fact, there was no in tagging? In fact, we don't have any evidence that there was tagging. Mm-hmm. I can't say there wasn't. I just don't, that we haven't seen any evidence emerge yet. Right. And, they're, and these same organizers have planned to hold a statewide tournament soon. And that's what's really kind of like you see certain countries like French Polynesia has banned shark fishing entirely. Uh, Sharks are a huge part of the, of the culture. Um, It's completely banned there. Hawaii shark fishing is banned. You can't do it. Um, There's no reason to have sport shark fishing. It's sharks are needed to uh, control certain populations that might eat seagrass or kelp beds, which are important for uh, reabsorption of carbon. They are the apex predator, therefore they manage the whole ecosystem. So when you remove sharks from the water, you you are damaging the ecosystem. Mm-hmm. I've written about this. We've talked about it before. So this is kind of an example of it. It's a great, it's a great like eleven minute video. Um, 
in, in, in uh, Malibu artist style. So I definitely urge you guys to check it out. Yeah, if you're watching on YouTube, you're seeing clips from it uh, mm -hmm. and we'll link the video up in the show notes, of course. But it is amazing to me that this is not outlawed. Yeah. And what is the sort of legislative resistance to making that happen? Well, it's Florida. It's a state by state thing. Um, in terms of hunting and fishing laws, I believe it is. And now that the EPA, you know, that, that there's that Supreme Court decision that was handed down that makes it harder for um, the EPA to, I guess, manage greenhouse gases. I don't know where that comes along in terms of this. You know, bull sharks are not endangered, so that's probably part of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, um, you can hunt them. I just think that we need to think differently about hunting and fishing laws. Um, I'm not, like I said, I'm not against fishing, fishermen doing their business and, and making a living as long as it's an environmentally sustainable way. Um, I respect them. Uh, this is not that. Aren't we on the cusp of Shark Week? Happening? I think it's happening, I yeah. Think it's, is it started and yet? And Denis Gromer, the start? great free diver that was swimming with the tiger sharks, he's in Shark Week this, oh, this he time. Is? Yeah, he's in With it. friend of the pod, Paul DeGelder, your friendly Shark Week Yeah, but host. I don't know if he's in that one. He's with, I forget um, who he's with. It's someone else we haven't talked about, but she's a, she's a reporter. And, right. and um, yeah. It's interesting that uh, despite mass enthusiasm for Shark Week, that uh, the laws aren't changing more rapidly. I mean, I would have to assume that Shark Week helps enhance, you, you know, sort of public awareness around these issues in a positive way. Or does it make people just scared of sharks? I mean, Paul's whole thing is helping people to understand, much like the Malibu artist, that you know these are these are you know these are important animals that we need to be protecting. Yeah, I mean, Not you know, hunting and fishing. I've been I've been diving and around professional divers for a long time, and I think that the awareness around sharks' con contributions to the ecosystem and its importance, and and the fact that they're not choosing to eat humans, and it's not they're not this predator to be feared as much, um, is growing definitely. Mm -hmm. So that's happening. It's just um, you know the leap from that to legislation is a different thing. Uh, you know, I, I can't answer to that. I will say that I think social media has made activism actually more impotent, to be honest with you, because like you think that you're doing something by tweeting or posting right. something on Instagram and you're not doing shit because that doesn't do anything. Right. So, um, you know, how you can do something is, is talking to people who make those decisions. So mm -hmm. that if anything we can learn from another thing we're gonna talk about soon, I don't wanna, you know, the, but obviously the abortion um, issue and, and Roe v. Wade getting overturned is that those were activists that were definitely boots on the ground for years and years and years and never stopped. And so like, that's how, that's how change happens, not by posting about it. Yeah, it is a weird thing because you have that press, pressure valve release if you talk about it on yeah. social media, right. but it's rather ineffectual. I mean, it's- it affects culture. I suppose good it, if yeah. you have a large platform and a large audience, yeah. it's important to say something and you know share your perspective and perhaps that can move the needle in terms of public opinion but ultimately right. change happens through relentless pressure boots on the ground type activism old That's school right. style but you know let's get to that later yeah. most important how the hell are you i uh i feel good okay right now good it's been an interesting couple of weeks um i'll start with uh my visit to boulder which i guess was two and a half weeks ago at this point um, I traveled to Boulder uh, to do some work with Solomon, who's my partner, longtime partner, friend of friend of the podcast, podcast supporter. Um, they were doing an event in Boulder to celebrate Solomon's 75, 75 years as a company, their 75th birthday, wow. which is super cool. And also um, to celebrate <clears throat> their, their best male ultra runner on their team, Francois Den, who is a wonderful human being and incredible ultra running champion who lives in France, uh, but had traveled to the United States uh, to get ready for the Hard Rock 100, which just transpired last weekend. And so I was to do a Q and A with Francois and there was a, like an event at this running store and there was a fun run and all that kind of stuff. So I went, it was great. The Q and A was amazing. I was able to do also, in addition to that, a podcast with Francois, which hmm. went really well, which cool. we'll be releasing at some point. Um, and a also- classic on the road podcast yeah, from back Yeah, I did too. And a real old school one with Gordo Byrne, who is a former Ultraman world champion, uh, who I'd never met in person, 
Uh, he's a coach and just a wise human being and somebody I wanted to meet for a very long time who's inspired me and kind of mentored me from afar. And we had an amazing podcast. So why is that old school, <clears throat> a real old school one? Just because he was an, a very early and profound influence on me when I was training for Ultraman as somebody who had had his own life transformation from being kind of a heavy set investment banker, hedge fund type guy living in Hong Kong to transforming his life. And, and performing at the highest level as an elite in Ironman and Ultraman. So mm. he won Ultraman. He also got second at Ironman Canada. Like wow. he was training with Scott Molina and living it like full time. Like, and he would share in the early days of the internet on his blogger, WordPress, whatever, like stuff that he learned. And he had a little podcast at the time called Endurance Corner where he would share training techniques, et cetera. And I just learned a lot from him mm -hmm. and he was very helpful to me and it was cool to be able to finally meet him. So That's that'll awesome. be coming out at some point as well. But the point being that I had a great experience in Boulder and then on the flight home, I started to feel not so great. What happened? It was How, very, what was the first symptom? Just, to, you know, a little congestion, a little heat in the forehead, like you a know, little a little too. scratchy, <laughs> like little- you Were know, you little, the guy everyone was looking at with like hate, hate in their eyes? I was <laughs> trying, I had a little tickle. <laughs> <laughs> a tickle in the back of the throat. And it reminded me uh, very vividly of my experience flying home from Miami less than three months prior, right. where I had hosted a conference and interacted with a lot of people mm -hmm. um, and, and felt my first COVID symptoms on that flight. And here I was again, having a, an analogous, very similar experience. Sure enough, COVID round two, I think 11 weeks yeah. after I'd had it the first time. Bummer. So that was not fun. I was down for the count for six or seven days, which is why we didn't have a roll on the other week. Right. Um, I'm feeling good now, but it was interesting. It was different from uh, the first go around. I'd be interested to hear from other people who have had it multiple times. First time I got it, I had two consecutive nights of pretty high fever and chills. This time I only had one. So I thought, oh, well, maybe I'm gonna get over this more quickly. But then I had a couple days of real depression and darkness. Mm. And this is something Julie experienced when she had it. Like it got really dark for her in a not great way, mental Jeez. health wise. And I got a taste of that, like not suicidal per se. I don't think it was that severe, but but definitely this sensation of like nothing matters and like what's right. the point? <laughs> you know, kind of that. I live there. I know, right? <laughs> That's <laughs> yeah, where I yeah. live. <laughs> yeah. Well, I maybe I you know I was able to crawl up into your skull for a couple yeah. Of days. Yeah. I'm, uh, I'm, yeah. The but, pessimism was looming. The dark I, cloud. I was take heavy. nothing matters as a a point of optimism. Yeah. As nothing matters. But no. But seriously, I did see you like had a cryptic tweet in there where you were like talking about. I forget what it was. It was like, I needed that today or something like that. I wonder if it was aligned with that I don't moment. I think so. I don't no? know. I, I think at some point I was like, here I go round two or something like okay. that. But I don't think I shared anything truly cryptic about that. Okay. Maybe I'm wrong. I don't know. Um, but yeah, so that was different that. and new the second time. Yeah. And then just, you know, weakness and it lingered for a while. And then when I thought I was basically on the cusp of crawling out of it and starting to feel better, Suddenly, I had a fever again on like right. day eight or something. Did you like have that. to retest? Um, yeah, I was testing like every couple of days. So yeah, I was still positive, still obviously positive. at that point. So this one lasted a little bit longer. Right. I feel fine now, um, but yeah, not. not well, that's why I sent like you that that COVID twice that story that from yeah. the, the tie. I don't even. I'm like reluctant to even share this story, but <laughs> this this. This post on this site called the Taiyi, T Y E E, get ready for the forever plague, is the most uh, depressing COVID story I've ever read. I don't know what's with, depressing and, and about with this that graphic. Fear, fear mongering, you know, <laughs> image to correspond to it. But essentially, the thesis of this article, and I, I would basically tell people not to read this, but it's, basically it's what it says is that's not, it's not going away. Right. These variants are going to continue. Uh, the, the vaccinations and the boosters can't keep pace with the yes. with the complexity of the you know the always you know new and and different variants and this is just something we're gonna have to live with and not for nothing once you've had it like we're seeing uh, the efficacy of like your own uh, Even your immune own system immune response system, yeah. dwindling and we're seeing more and more people with longer health uh, negative health 
predicaments as a result of repeated exposure. Right. And I think what it's an appeal to is basically, uh, you know, be smart, continue to mask up in certain environments. It's not saying he's, it's not an advocation. It's not, not advocating um, shutdowns at all. It's saying like, if you're indoors in a tight space, you probably should still mask up um, outdoors. You're probably fine. But you know, this idea that six feet is enough is not really there either. And, um, and so, and there is long-term help that we're not hearing about like long-term impacts on immune system and immune response and, and even vital organs. So they're, they're finding this stuff. It's real science. Um, we're not hearing about it as much. I think people are also just don't want to bother with it anymore because, you know, it's not really so I mean, much. That's we, the case. We're yeah. seeing a huge spike in Los Angeles right now. Yeah. Nobody's masked up. People are just not willing to do it anymore. Well, I think we, we, you know, we've been abandoned in some ways and in getting information from leaders. I think it's not, we've been abandoned. We don't really want it. Um, you know, I, I think, I, I think we also just aren't mature enough to handle the truth. Well, which we've is also, like, we've like, also been misled so many times without right. pointing fingers. Like the, the, yeah. the, the public policy response has been so bungled in so many ways that, there is a level of distrust and people at this point want to just get on with their lives, right. you know, and right. it is what it is. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to turn this into a, you know, a COVID no, podcast. No, no, no. Um, it's all true. <clears throat> but, I will say that it seems that COVID <clears throat> might be the price of international travel these days. I, I've heard it from multiple people who've come back from awesome getaways that got COVID on the way back. Just a lot of people are getting it right now. You've had... I, our swim teacher <laughs> for for Zuma and a couple of his and like three of his friends um, went to Barcelona for uh, a couple of weeks. By the way, swim teachers they get paid so well now. Are you aware of this? I taught swimming in college. Did you teach swimming growing up at all? I was a lifeguard and a coach, but I never taught swim lessons. Or maybe I did briefly. I taught swim you lessons. Can, you, can, you can definitely charge a premium, especially in Los Angeles. I think I made 25 an hour at the most, like yeah. on a private lesson. These, these swim teachers today, and it's, I'm, not, I'm not gonna pinpoint her because it's everyone, I got quotes from multiple. It's like 30 bucks a head for like a 30 minute lesson with toddlers. So they'll get, it's not- Not bucks for a, a private, for a group. For, for a, a semi-private, it's like, it's like lawyer money, like 120 <laughs> bucks for 30 minutes. It's amazing. And of course she goes to Barcelona, but then she got COVID and we didn't get her. To, mm. we, we, missed a, we missed another week, but um, I hope she gets well. Yeah, well, one final thing on this before we yeah. move off of it. The other weird thing that happened when I had COVID was, um, you know, as I've shared many times, I've had this lower back pain, um, but during COVID that seemed to exacerbate and in addition to that, I had insane, insane nerve pain down um, the qu my right quadriceps. That's crazy. So much so that I, I couldn't move my leg, let alone put any weight on it. So I was like hobbling around, like I, I needed like crutches. And I believe it was a pinched nerve at L2, L3, the pinched lateral femoral cutaneous nerve. Um, but it was unbelievably painful. And that and happens from COVID? Very, very acute experience that I've never, I've never had that before. So I thought, well, maybe all the lying down in bed, right. you know, created this. Um, but I did come across some information because of course you Google it and then you right. go down these crazy rabbit holes. And right. I don't know if this is the case, but there does seem to be some evidence that, uh, that as a complication of COVID-19, there's this thing called acute transverse myelitis, which is inflammation on both sides of one section of spinal cord that damages the insulating material covering nerve cell fiber. So essentially, um, <laughs> that <sounds good>. so <laughs> essentially like inflammation of, of the, of the kind of the, what, what covers right. the nerves. And, uh, and that inflammation caused an impingement, an impingement at L2 or L3. Does that regenerate? And that? so I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, there's, you know, here's a research study that you right. can read that I can link up. Um, all I know is that, you know, I was praying that it would just go away and it did eventually. Oh. And I so don't know prayer, where it went away. I don't, yeah, prayer yeah. I don't know if it went away naturally as a result of me getting over COVID, but I was also doing electric stimulation therapy, you know, mm. these little devices and sure. you attach these electrodes to kind of loosen up the muscles. And yeah. that seemed to, that seemed to help. But, uh, you know, I'd be curious if anyone else out there had, has experienced anything similar to that. 
Interesting. Because I haven't, I haven't heard of anybody, but uh, it was very strange and extremely painful. But dude, like I said, I feel good. I'm back. In How's the, the back Happy generally? People. It's getting better. Good. Yeah. It's getting slowly, slowly getting better. Building back a little bit. Um, trying to get reconnected with fitness and doing all these little exercises to improve glute strength and nice. pelvic mobility and all that kind of stuff. How is how are your glutes and your pelvic mobility? They are so awesome yeah. right now. <laughs> no, good. I was doing good and then COVID hit and <laughs> I wasn't doing anything during right. that. And I gotta be really, you know, one thing everybody has told me is just be really conservative and cautious about getting back into fitness too quickly mm. so you don't have some kind of relapse, so. That's it. Julie turned 60 this week. So, Happy birthday, Julie. Yes. On Thursday, as a matter of fact, the day this podcast comes out. So that's exciting. Throw a big party for Julie. Are you throwing a big party? Um, throwing a little party at the house for her friends. Nice. Which is fun. And uh, and yeah, man. Any Happy karaoke, to be back karaoke? with you. Okay. She's going to perform with the boys. Really? With music. Fantastic. Yeah, it'll be good. Um, so let's move off of this. What else do we want to talk about? Well, first of all, let's take a minute to uh -huh. just recap the fact that Cory Booker was on Roll On. You mean Cory Booker, my favorite, <laughs> uh, my favorite it, it wellness influencer? He is. He has become. <laughs> he is your new self help guru. He is. I get his. He posts every, every day videos every day of empowering advice, it's, it's and very he does it. In, <laughs> it really <laughs> it is. is. It is. You know, so how, yeah. it was pretty cool. I, I I think what was funny about that is we were so stoked that we actually got his office to agree to a 15 minute interview. Amazing. And I was like being very cautious of not trying to run over our time allotment and be respectful of him. And yeah. if you listen to it, <laughs> I keep kind of interjecting, trying to end it. And he was like, no, I want to keep going. And he kept talking. And I think we went for like 45 minutes, which was unbelievable. He, he was fabulous, you know, inspiring and really um, the, the voice we needed at that moment. Um, it was really cool of him to take the time and to talk to us. And the fact that he's a listener and that he's on a run streak inspired by, uh, Hella, it's the, it's the same. It's the same thing that uh, that Jason's on, right. basically. Yeah, the run street. Right, right, right. Hella's reach. Hella is knows you know, no boundaries. Right, he's just continuing. To, and Hella's what seven years in? He just did like a birthday thing of it, right. like a like yeah. So he's he's amazing, uh, and he's so inspiring. And he's inspiring senators, and it just shows you what you can do, what you can do. You know what social media is good for, which mm -hmm. is this like this kind of some ideas do get into the culture and he has influenced, changed people's lives. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, uh, but anyway, yeah, Senator Booker, that was a great experience. And yeah, so yeah, it's, we're, we're, I think we're on a bit of a, a jag here because now we got Malcolm Gladwell on the podcast this week. That Amazing. was definitely like a huge get. From day one, he was somebody I wanted to have on. Um, took a long time to make it happen, but we made it happen. He couldn't have been cooler or more delightful. I'm really proud of that conversation. We had a lot of fun. I think you had a chance to listen to a little bit yeah, yeah, of yeah. It on the it, way in. I loved it. It was, it was, it's like, it's like the perfect geek out where you guys can just like, you drop into a, a topic and then you just immediately go deep and then you go to another one because you have great overlap. I mean, I, I you right. Know. But it all comes back to running. Yeah. Well, you running know? and then also, but also media. Yeah, you, know, you also have the media, yeah, podcasting too. So yeah. you know all of that, and um, his uh, his new show, Legacy of Speed, which is kind of it's built around. Um, I caught an episode of that, which is you know with Coach Bud Winter and that mm -hmm. whole thing, and, and it's like a perfect uh, Gladwell deep dive into something that we thought we understood or we've all heard about, and he you know shows it in such new light, which right. is uh, really cool. And I think I said it in the podcast, it might be the most Gladwellian of all Gladwell projects ever, because it has <laughs> aspects of all the things yep. that he loves and is interested in, starting with track and field, but also when a certain group of people end up at the same place at the same time yep. and some kind of magic ensues, like that's a big kind of recurring Gladwell trope um, and the intersection of like sport, culture, politics, and and also, of course, the sort of misunderstood aspect of all of it, because mm -hmm. there was a lot that was misunderstood about those protests, yep. what they meant, how they were interpreted at the time, and what happened to those athletes as a result of taking that you know really courageous stand. Yeah, I mean, I think what happened to them was, is isn't misunderstood. I mean, they they were. Uh, you know, they, they were basically treated as pariah mm -hmm. um, and it wasn't respected. It was like, they were widely thought that they, um, that they tarnished the Olympics uh, and, 
And it, so, I mean, that, that I think was very clear. And then I, I forget which one of them ends up in um, the desert as a professor or something, or as a coach. One, uh, is it John um, Carlos? I think it's That's John a, Carlos. Yeah, John I could Carlos. be wrong, but yeah. I think it, yeah, I think it is John Carlos. Um, but, you know, you, you reading about them later, you obviously, you know, by the time I came, oh, became aware of what happened, it, 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 it um, you know, always respected those guys. I mean, imagine the courage that took uh, in 1968 to do right. that and how selfless that mm -hmm. act was. Um, now we see kind of people speaking out on issues and they make it kind of almost performative, but that was like, really, they took a huge risk and suffered for it. Um, and it, it, it's remarkable, you know. That and happened. a lot has changed, and a lot hasn't. When you look at Colin Kaepernick, and right. realize what he has suffered as a result of the courageous stand that he took. Yeah, and also, you know, contextualizing the impact of like Bud Winter and Professor Harry Edwards. Like, without those two guys at that place at that time, you don't get Colin Kaepernick, and you don't get Usain Bolt. Right. Usain Bolt coming from the Bud Winter uh, um, strategy of, of relaxing, yeah. relaxed sprinting, relaxed yeah. Uh, effort. Um, yeah, so it's all, it's an amazing deep dive. Uh, really, thank you for turning me on to that. And I love the, that you brought up the LeBron, like Malcolm challenging LeBron to a mile in yeah. your podcast with him. That was amazing. I know, I'd like to see that happen. I don't think LeBron ever got back to him. <laughs> no, <laughs> it's, the risk is too high on his Have end. you seen that video though of LeBron? No, like I running? wanna see that. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you uh, have that? Are you putting uh, that in, in the show notes? I'll, well, why don't, let's, uh, let's take a break, quick yeah. break, and we'll be back with that. And uh, also some other kind of related stuff to Legacy of Speed. Prophets Walk Among Us. As a writer and podcaster for nearly 10 years, I've become more convinced than ever that our world is populated by scores of beautiful and brilliant people who have amazing stories to share. Those that we don't know who can teach us something new and leave us all the better for the experience of their sharing. And so I've dedicated my career to tracking down the most compelling prophets on the planet, going deep with each of them on my podcast to elucidate the best of what they have to offer and to sharing the insights gleaned for the benefit of all. But the podcast is not the only medium by which to share their stories, which is why I'm proud to announce the release of my new book, Voicing Change, Volume 2. More than mere words on paper, Voicing Change is a physical manifestation of the magic, inspiration, and timeless wisdom that transpires each week on the Ritual Podcast. The first edition of Voicing Change was a beautifully rendered book worthy of display on any coffee table. And volume two follows in that tradition by showcasing even more of my favorite conversations in an elegant publication replete with interview excerpts, essays, and stunning photography, making for an exquisite companion to the first volume or a satisfying standalone work. Picking up this book allows you to revisit the wisdom of your favorite everyday prophets and physically interact with the life-changing ideas contained within. Voicing Change Volume 2, available now while supplies last for a limited time. Order your copy today only at richroll.com. All right, we're back. Before we, I did find the LeBron video. I'm gonna show that to you guys for a second, those of you who are watching on YouTube, but I forgot to tell this really embarrassing uh, Malcolm story. Hey, do I have your attention? Yeah, I'm just watching like, LeBron. I know, come on. All eyes over here, buddy. <laughs> I thought I was supposed to be watching this. <laughs> no, we're getting to that in a minute. Oh, okay. Um, so this is probably, I can't believe I'm gonna tell this story. Um, six years ago, seven yeah. years ago, I can't remember. I was in New York City and I was gonna be speaking at this um, event that was upstate. It was for Engine 2, Rip Esselstyn's uh, company. They, were, they do this annual thing at the Esselstyn farm called Plant Stock and okay. all these plant-based people come and speak. And it's, it's really fun actually, I've been a couple of times. So anyway, I was taking the train north out of Ma Manhattan up into the Hudson Valley. Mm -hmm. And I got off at this small town and somebody from the event met me at the train station, picked me up and we're driving down like the main street of whatever this little town was on our way to tr tr you know, sort of travel out to this farm. Yep. And, and I'm just looking out the window and we pass a cafe 
And sitting out in front of the cafe, like eating a muffin is Malcolm Gladwell. Oh, you told me <laughs> this, story. Told this story. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. This is a great story. Yeah, and go on. it was so like the juxtaposition of like, if I'd seen him like walking down the street in Manhattan or jog running in the park or something like that, like I would expect, like that would be sort of to be expected. Right. Like he's in his natural environment. I didn't realize that he had a place upstate. Right. I now know that he, you know. That's where he lives, right? That's where he lives, I yeah. think, yeah. probably all the time now. Yeah. But six years ago, I just thought he was somebody who lived in Manhattan. And so when I'm in this small town in the middle of nowhere and I see Malcolm Gladwell sitting by himself in running, you know, in his running gear, like eating his breakfast, something came over me. Like, and we live in LA, you see celebrities all the time, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't get like, I don't get like off kilter. Verklempt. 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 Yes, to use the, Verklempt? use your, Verklempt. your heritage, heritage's, heritage's <laughs> vernacular. I get it. Um, <laughs> But I lost all motor function and I like rolled down the window and I just blurted out like, I love a revisionist history. Like really? I just completely lost control of myself. <laughs> yeah. I love and he kind of like looked over, like uh, like side-eyed me and was kind of like, eh, you know, like that. Did, did you I was tell like, him this story? And, no, I was too embarrassed to. And then I <laughs> like kind of rolled up the window and like, then I just slunk down into my what? seat, like, like sort of embarrassed, like, oh right. my God, I can't believe I did that. Like I literally, it wasn't a conscious decision. It no. just like something came over me because like I have so much respect for that guy and right. I'm such a fan of everything that 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 he does. Um, truly, you know, that I just, I, I was like completely starstruck. See, this is six to seven years ago before being a podcast super fan was cool. Now, like everyone is re listening to podcasts. And so it's like, it's like that was just starting. Like it was just starting. Like you, you guys were. But that, and it dated before that too, th through his books and before. Well, of course. But you know what I mean? That, it's but... like, it's like podcast super fandom, mm -hmm. which is now a normal thing. Yeah, it's weird. That, that, listeners, that's what I want you to take from this story. Not only does he podcast, he is a huge podcast fan. Are you not? You're a oh, huge yeah. fan of the form. I am. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. So if you see me sitting outside eating a muffin somewhere, roll your window down and, and blur something out. And, and I'll know that you listen to this episode of the podcast. <laughs> and scream, scream yeah. illegibly. Um, anyway, I illegibly. did find the video of LeBron. Uh, Blake's going to pull it up right there. So basically he's doing laps around the perimeter of a basketball court. And he's yep. got a guy posting up um, around the, the free throw line on each side. Amazing. feeding him basketballs and he's just doing layups and dunking and stuff like that. And he's running pretty fast. And I think this video, which has something like, this one has 4.6 million views, it looks like, um, is what led Malcolm to think, this guy is an unbelievable endurance athlete. And if we were to do a mile challenge, I think he would beat me. He is such a beast, man. I mean, mm -hmm. like his his physical conditioning is second to none. Yeah, I mean, the it's interesting to hear him talk about also the elite athletes and longevity versus peak performance. It's almost as if like, cause LeBron is in his 20th year. I know. 20th year. And he did, did you see him? He was at the, you know, they have the, the this kind of uh, pickup type of game. I think it's, it's called Drew. I forget, I forget what it's called, but it, they, used to, they used to do it in, um, in New York in a park. Um, and they they did it in a gym. Oh, that park down yeah. by Fourth Street. Yeah, 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 yeah. Off yeah. Sixth Avenue. Mm -hmm, yeah, I know mm -hmm, what you mean. Mm -hmm. And so now they're doing at Rucker Park or something. They'd have it there sometimes. This was at a at a gym. I don't know where it was. And I saw him in New York City in a gym, like working. Was out that with New York City? Yeah. yeah. And he, uh, but no, but this is a basketball scenario. So he went with a, um, Demar Derozan, another NBA player, and they went and played against some of these guys that are really good, but not obviously at the NBA level. And you know it's 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 famous for people coming in and trying to, and just putting on shows. And he mm -hmm. hadn't been there since 2011, and he just you know took owned over it. the gym and owned it. it was, was Kevin Love part of that too? He wasn't on the um, on the floor this time. Mm. Yeah, he wasn't on the floor this time. It was him and Demar Derozan were the two I'll NBA check guys. It out. Um, yeah. Well, on the subject of legacy of speed and all things Gladwellian, yep. I think it dovetails pretty nicely into this next story that we want to talk about, which is super interesting. So, set yeah, this up. And, and even even the LeBron mentioned dovetails into it because we're talking about um, the greatest athlete in the first half of the 20th century. So, if mm -hmm. you you know of his era, um, Jim Thorpe who was the, the winner of uh, the 1912 Olympic gold medal for the decathlon and the pentathlon. Uh, also a professional baseball player, 
a uh, college football, uh, uh, a renowned and like beloved college football player before the Olympics, a uh, pro football player after the Olympics. Um, he was just restored as the sole winner of his 1912 Olympic medals. And when he won them, he destroyed the field and it wasn't mm -hmm. even close. Um, and he was the star of the ticker tape parade down Broadway after that. Um, Jim Thorpe is of uh, uh, indigenous heritage. He's a Native American of the Sauk and Fox, so I don't know how to pronounce it, Sauk and Fox Nation in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. um, and he grew up in those tribal schools where the uh, kids had to cut their hair and they couldn't speak their, their native tongue. And uh, similar kind of order, I don't exactly know where you know, how his school compares to the ones in Canada, but, you know, people were, a lot of children were mistreated and even died under the care of these tribal schools. There was a big controversy of these mass graves that were, that, that were found in Canada. Certainly some abuse happened in America too. So he's a product of those schools, um, but becomes this amazing athlete, it, it, you know, takes over the Olympics along with Duke uh, Kanamoko, who was the other star, happened mm -hmm. to be native Hawaiian, and they became friends on the steamship over to the 1912 Olympics. Um, Which is like a scene out of Chariots of Fire. Yeah, just unbelievable. These two native guys representing America having been, um, you know, vi victims of America, um, yet recommend, re but yet also representing and, and, and showing with pride and dominating. And anyway, uh, a year, not even, a, maybe less than a year after winning those Olympic medals and being celebrated, um, he had his medal stripped uh, because he had earned $25 a game playing minor league baseball when he needed money uh, years before right. the Olympics. Which and is so. where it intersects with legacy of speed. Yeah. And the kind of legacy of Avery Brundage, the IOC president who had this fanatical concept of what it meant to be an amateur athlete mm -hmm. and, and his staunch position that politics and sport should never intersect. But that allegiance to this idealized notion of amateurism, um, you know, played into decisions that Brundage made over the many decades that he lorded over the IOC. Obviously, this is many years prior to that, but that concept comes into play. Like I'd never heard this story, but the mm -hmm. fact that, like, okay, he had to, he, had, you know, he had to pay some bills. He had to like you right. know, make a little money, so right. he, he picked up twenty five bucks to play. A different sport. Like semi-pro baseball right. or whatever, which yeah. was like, it's not baseball as we think of it now. He wasn't now. a major it leaguer, was, no. It wasn't, yeah. And, yeah. and they used that to strip him of his gold medals. Like, I didn't even know that that had happened. And not only strip him, but that made him in, il, um, in, ineligible to, to again compete in 1916 and 1920. Um, and, you know, because at that time, the decathlon champion was the best athlete in the world. That was the mm -hmm. revered. And it, right. it, it, it remained that way all the way through um, you know, probably through 76 with Bruce Jenner was kind of the peak of that. But in 1912, um, he got, in 1913, he gets stripped. And so he, what does he do? He goes and plays pro baseball. Right. And, and plays. What's interesting is he <laughs> went to this small school called Carlisle. Right. 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 And then in 1911, they beat Harvard. In football. Right. And, and Harvard was the best team because <laughs> yeah. of him. Because, right. because he was so dominant and he was like a running back and a kicker. And so he played pro baseball for whatever, six, seven seasons. And then in 1920, he decides to play pro, fo pro football and he plays till he's 41 years old. <laughs> and he's like one of the best football players, uh, maybe the best. So, yeah. um, I mean, this is one of the great athletes ever. And he's now been restored as the sole winner. I think it's uh, some years after uh, he was, he was again restored as like, co-winners like they they elevated right. the, the guys they yeah, elevated in the 80s they they made him co-winner right. like so he had to share his gold with the people that he actually beat and he was i mean i don't know i think he was he he, he was dead then already right and and in you know when the other guys to their credit when they were told they won they were like no they weren't really stoked on the idea of being told they won because it's weird because they know they yeah. were there it wasn't their <laughs> they decision. Were, they they were knew there. they got their asses handed <laughs> to them. Were, like now I'm supposed to like wear this gold medal. <laughs> right. And so now he's restored as, uh, you know, what is it? 110 years later and he's restored. It took 110 years to Dude. set matters to rights on this, which is crazy. And and my sense from that article was that the, the reinstatement of his titles happened kind of quietly. Right. It was, it was a Native American publication That's right. that, somehow picked up on the story and and ultimately how it ended up in the New York Times. But 
it wasn't like there was a press release or any kind of big announcement around no. this. And Jim and and you know Jim Thorpe, aka Bright Path Strong, which is I mean, what a what a name. That's uh, ballsy. Is golden again. Why has there never been a biopic about this guy? Can you imagine today a guy who wins? Let's say he didn't get his amateur status revoked, so he wins gold in decathlon and pentathlon. Pentathlon doesn't exist anymore. There is pentathlon. Right. It's different in the Winter right. Olympics. Right. Um, he returns in 1916 and 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 wins again. Then he goes, like, that could have happened, right? Well, that's what and Duke, then, that's what happened with Duke. With Duke he, kept, right. he kept going back. He didn't take The money. biopic yeah. is the relationship between those two guys yes. and telling those two stories, I think. But then for Thorpe to go on, <clears throat> play pro baseball for six years, and then play pro football for, until he was 41, but he started in 1920. So how many years was, was that? 15 years or something like that? <laughs> I mean, he's out of college like, in 1911, you, so it's like, nine years no, after college. No no other athlete in modern history in the second half no. of the, the century has been able to do The that. only thing you can think of is uh, David Robinson, who was an elite college basketball player. And then he had to take a year off before going to college to play, to be able to play pro. He had to stay in the Navy mm -hmm. for like a year. It was supposed to be five years, but they let him out. At, I think it was a year. They gave him a special dispensation. Um, was he on the Olympic basketball team also? I think he was. I believe I he was. Remember. But I think yeah. he was on the Olympic basketball team as a pro later when it was mm -hmm. okay it's for pros to play. Right. Um, I yeah, think this he was is on different. The this is different. Yeah. Um, but yeah, super interesting to read that after ADC listening team. to Legacy of Speed. Also. Yeah, he was on, I think David Robinson might have been on the 88 Olympic team and the 92. He was on the dream team for sure, I would think. I mean, he was that year or maybe the I next think so. One. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Too old to remember. Um, anyway, uh, that's an amazing story. Somebody should definitely make that movie though. Yeah. I mean, uh, probably could find it. I wonder if there's ever been one, but there should be one, you know. There must series. be some kind of no doc one watches documentary. Movies anymore. Now it's got to be a, a limited series. A Netflix series. limited series. A limited series. Or a Pushkin uh, limited series podcast. Or a Rich Roll <laughs> yeah, limited maybe. series podcast. Should we move into that? We'll yeah. see. Um, the next story is is also quite amazing. And this, you know, created kind of a tidal wave of news across the world. Um, it's a story about Mo Farah, the, the legendary track and field athlete. He, he disclosed in a documentary that I believe is coming out this week um, by the BBC that he had been trafficked to the United Kingdom from Somalia three decades earlier under mm -hmm. a false name and had been essentially a house servant yep. for many years until he finally told his gym teacher at school what actually was happening. Yes. And Apparently the authorities were apprised of this. He was able to get out of that and and the like, but he's kind of quietly held this secret for a very long time. Crazy. Can you imagine? Can you imagine being so gifted and celebrated as an athlete, but also um, you know, carrying that secret for so long? Mm. You know, all the way through being knighted. Mm. It's unbelievable. I mean, this guy, yeah, in 2000 he was granted UK citizenship. 2012, he won two golds in the Olympics, the 5K and the 10K. 2016, he repeated with golds in both of those events, despite accidentally getting tripped in the 10K and still winning. Yep. 2017, he gets knighted. And then he kind of hangs up the, the spikes in track and field, gets into the marathon and runs 205. Unbelievable. In 2018. Unbelievable. I mean, from the um, and 10K I, I think he's going to run the, the London Marathon this yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so on the and theme well of, of Avery Brundage, <laughs> yeah. slavery Avery, what would what would Avery Brundage, ha, you know, have made of uh, Mo Farah's amateur status? Because why? And his uh, his relationship with amateurism. Because he'd been, uh, or because he wasn't really a citizen of England or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I mean, he would. Yeah, basically, like he's not really a citizen. It, it would have it would have given you know his racism an excuse to strip oh, sure. him. Of he would have found he would have found a way. Um, but, uh, anyway, you know, the New York a, times wrote a, there's a couple, there's two stories yeah. in the New York times about this. Talia um, Minsberg, my editor wrote the first one where, which kind of came on the heels of the, you know, right before the BBC documentary. So she yeah, was the one to kind of break this for them. And then, um, this, this other one, uh, I think it's Jarrett Longman, Jerry Longman, or, uh, I don't know how to pronounce the first yeah, name. That's the second um, one here. How Mo Farah outran. Yeah. His, uh, that's beginnings. someone who has covered him many times. Um, and kind of knows his story back and 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 forth, um, and so uh, you know that's a good one too. Uh, it's crazy, crazy to think of 
that, but it's not uncommon. You know, East Africa has had that. Sudan, um, there's been uh, people who've been smuggled out of Sudan. They think they're, or they they're told they're coming they're coming over and they're going to earn money as a as a, a domestic worker in. Um, say Saudi Arabia or in the Arabian Peninsula, mm-hmm. and then are uh, not given any money and are are basically like the fishermen that you've seen that you've heard about on you know the Burmese fishermen on right. Thai fishing boats. You know there is slavery to this day happening. I mean, sure. there is, and this is an example of it. It's good that, but it's he, I can't recall another instance in which a super high profile never, person never has disclosed no. that this happened to no, them. This is yeah. This is this is a whole nother level, and he even had an autobiography that this wasn't in. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's the thing. Yeah. So imagine the courage of of coming out and disclosing this. I guess there were some rumblings about how that would affect his UK citizenship, and and you know downstream of that, like would he be able to retain his Olympic titles? Right. But they've kind of put that to rest. That's yes. not going to happen. Right. He was a victim, yeah. and he was underage. Sure. As as it should be. Yeah. Um, I love this quote. Um, in this article, Farah's racing style was not dissimilar to the way he faced the vicissitudes of his life, starting from behind, persevering lap after lap, patient and resilient, then finishing with an illuminating sprint to the tape. Amazing. Beautiful guy. I'd love to, I'm, I'm going to rewatch the 1912, uh, 10,000, I mean, 1912, excuse me, 2012, uh, 10,000 meter. Is that stuff on YouTube? Oh yeah. Yeah. And any race you want, any concert you right. want, it's all on YouTube. Right, right, right. Did you watch the the old Bud Greenspan Olympic movies like Sixteen Days to Glory? No, like he would make oh they're fantastic. Yeah. Really, he made one about the nineteen eighty four Olympics called uh, Sixteen Days of Glory. Mm. I think you would like, but he was sort of the official documentarian of the Olympic movement in the modern era, and there's tons of his stuff on on YouTube. See, but you know we're talking about Jim Thorpe and you know Mo Farah and 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 uh, and. Uh, Juan Carlos and and um, Tommy Smith. It's like the idea of stripping people, banning people, boycotting. Um, the more I think about it, the more ridiculous it is. And it's like Wimbledon just happened. The Russian athletes couldn't play there. I mean, these are not Russian athletes that are involved in any way mm-hmm. in the Ukraine invasion. They just can't play because they, they're in Russia. Or 1984, I think it was a mistake to... Uh, f- 1980. 1980 was a mistake for us to to boycott the Soviet, yeah. and then 1984 was a mistake for them to boycott in in response the United States, uh, L.A. Olympics. So it's like all of that. I think it's very clear those are mistakes, and it's always better to get all the best athletes out there together. It's the only way to if sports is going to help in any way deal with world issues. Mm-hmm. All the athletes have to be present. That's my opinion on it. Yeah, right. I mean, this came up in the in the conversation with Malcolm. This right. idea, he does a whole episode in Legacy of Speed on this subject of exit, voice, or loyalty, right? And and to boycott is to exit. You can use your voice as these athlete activists did, or you can be loyal and fall into line with the Avery Brundages of the world. And I think if history tells us anything, it's that voice is the most powerful. And over time, history, you know, always favors the bold when it comes to that. I mean, has anybody performed a high level, high visibility protest at something like the Olympics or the Olympics itself that decades later you think, yeah, that was a misstep? Like usually it ends up being a really powerful symbol for some kind of necessary positive cultural shift or change. Yeah, I mean, in this case, obviously they they suffered in the immediate term, but now- Yeah, they pay the price short term, Yeah, but long term it is, you know, it's a lever for for progress, I think. I mean, I think uh, Muhammad Ali is the best example of someone who um, refused to go to to join the army, refused all the entreaties Mm -hmm. to, it'll be easy, you don't have to go to war, blah, blah, blah. And he just said, no, I'm not a part of your uh, machine and became even more of a hero. Yeah. Yeah. Shifting gears. Yep. We need to report on an update in the, uh, case that we referred, that we discussed, uh, at length. Was it the last time we did? Dung dong. Yeah, I know. So true crime. If you listen to the last roll on that we did, I think it was the last one. I think it was. Um, we discussed the murder of this professional gravel cyclist, Mo Wilson. Yep. Um, and the, the the leading suspect in that case being Caitlin Armstrong, the girlfriend of 
another professional cyclist, Colin Strickland, um, sort of this weird love tri triangle thing. I don't wanna rehash all the details of the relationship that led to this. Uh, but when we last left off over six weeks ago, Caitlin Armstrong uh, had, had sort of disappeared. She was in the wind. She was in the wind. She was on the lam. A photograph of her uh, at LaGuardia Airport in classic kind of security footage, blurry, you know. Yeah. Uh, take, uh, you know, was seen. And Why then, is security footage always blurry? Well, that was the meme with the web telescope. <laughs> Did you see this going no, around? Like, no. we're going to talk about the web, to the web the images from web no, being like, that. yeah, it's like on the one hand, the web image of like, we can see billions of years into the past. Yeah. And then on the other hand, security footage from 10 feet away. <laughs> <laughs> and you can't make out the person's face. Yes, yes. Yeah, in the era of like, you know, incredible uh, photography right. on cell phones, you'd think like we can upgrade our security cameras. I know. But anyway, yeah, it was a, it, it, you could see it in lots of the press. Like it, it's a very blurry image. It's surprising that you could even tell it was her. Right. And well, Tommy uh, Lee Jones knew it was her. Yeah, exactly. So yeah. fugitive on the lam, the US Marshals are on the hunt. Yes. And it literally took six weeks to run her down, but she was captured in Costa Rica, right. in this town called Santa Teresa, which is kind of a surf spot in this place called Don John's Lodge, yeah. where she was using an alias, Ari Martin, and kind of teaching yoga and staying in hostels, but not necessarily hiding, kind of like living her life. And and we're we're, you know, we're kind of joking around about it. I mean, it's quite tragic. Yes. Mo Mo Wilson was beloved. Um she, by all accounts, I mean, I had never met her, but she was a wonderful human being. And she was literally slain in cold blood by this woman, yes. Caitlin Armstrong, who split. I think the, the, the leading kind of idea is that, I think she was seen at Newark Airport. Like she flew to LaGuardia. Okay. And then there were four days where she was unaccounted for, but apparently her sister lives in upstate New York. And then she shows up at Newark Airport and that's where she catches the flight to Costa Rica. She had a valid passport, just not her own. And I think the idea is that she borrowed her or stole her sister's. I don't know if that's verified. Okay. Um, and, you know, goes down there and bops around taking buses and spending time in hostels and little surf villages throughout Costa Rica. Crazy. Until finally these marshals, I, I'm still not clear entirely how they tracked her down. Uh, maybe it was... Uh, following this, this passport, I'm not sure. Maybe but she the was Costa like Rican working Bureau. as a yoga instructor. She dyed her hair, she changed her name. Mm -hmm. um, they did find a receipt for $6,300 for plastic surgery that had a different name on it. The implication being that she had undergone plastic surgery. I guess she was seen with a Band-Aid on her nose. Why would you keep that receipt? Like, can you return the plastic surgery? <laughs> I, don't, I don't, I don't know, for tax purposes. <laughs> Why would Adam. you keep that receipt? Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, this story is bananas, yeah. is it not? And and this, it, you know, I just pulled up a, uh, an article from the Boston Globe. I mean, there is a, you know, two photos of her before and after, and she does look. She doesn't look any different. She's got different color hair. Maybe, and not it depends. Smiling. I mean, I, you would have to know her, I suppose. Yeah. But th I mean, that looks like two different people to me, doesn't it? Yes. I mean, the one thing I'll say, which I said at the time, which was right before the shooting in Uvalde, was that like, if she didn't have access to a gun, her um, mental health breakdown would not have led to the shattering of yeah. three plus lives. I think the gun, and the I could be wrong oh. about this, but I think the gun was owned by Colin Strickland. No, I think they bought them, to, like he- Oh, they bought I, it they together? Bought, they both had, I think they both had them, if I remember correctly, but mm. it's been a while since I read it. But um, yeah, I mean, she shouldn't have been empowered to be able to take the life of Mo Wilson. The other interesting thing is that, uh, at the, at the onset of the case, she was obviously a suspect and they brought her in for questioning okay. based on a, an outstanding warrant that was already out there because she had skipped out on paying, a, paying for Botox, like 600 bucks or something like that. Okay. And so they used that warrant to bring her in, but apparently there was an error on the warrant. Like they had her date of birth wrong or something like that. So they had to release her. So that basically she then knew like, oh man, I need to get out of Dodge quickly oh. here. And she immediately went and sold her Jeep for like $12,000. And that's when she split. But did she, like, what did she think? Like she, did she delude herself into thinking she was just gonna build this whole new life down in Costa Rica and no one would be the wiser? 
what a crazy story, man. Anyway, my heart goes out to Mo Wilson's family yes. and her friends. And, Sorry, I uh, joked about I'm it. I'm glad that that this person is in custody now and she's being charged with first degree murder as well as a you know, battery of other charges. Switching gears. <laughs> How's Segway? that for a segue? We need some sound effects. I know. <laughs> Jason, can you work on that? Um, switching gears. Um, in in, in, in news <laughs> from the headlines of, of people running across the United States, oh, yes. another recurring old school theme of the roll on podcast, right? Like, yes. People tend to do this frequently. It People you know tend to run across <laughs> yes. whole well, countries. I would say this person is an internet friend. We haven't met in person yet, okay. but I'm going to get him on the podcast soon. We're trying to schedule it. His name is Mike Wardian, and he recently ran from San Francisco to Rehoboth Beach on the East Coast in Delaware. Mm. Um, Michael is a very accomplished elite ultra runner. He's 48 now, and he's got this you know giant beard, and he does kind of evoke this Forrest Gump you know, he does look, vibe yeah, he does look like a stunt doing. double. Um, and what I like about him is that he, you know, he has a normal life too. Like he's this incredible runner, but he's also, uh, you know, he also uh, works as a partner in an international ship brokerage firm. I don't know what that means. Yeah, but what it sounds like mean? a real job. Does that mean he's <laughs> like, He's brokering in like He's brokering know, cargo big ships, yacht deals like, or I don't, I'm not cargo. Sure. Like I think like shipping, like shipping boat, okay. like you know cargo okay. boats. Who knows? Like he's. Selling. We need to get to the. This will be the focus of the podcast. So what with him. do you do? I, I need to know running. more about international ship brokerage. Yeah, um, he's got two kids. Seems like has a he's great got a wife, vibe. two dogs. Yeah. Seems like a super cool guy. Yeah. Um, and and here's the thing: he ran across the United States. And he did it in 61 days. Amazing. So just for context, Robbie Ballinger, who's an absolute beast, um, did it in 75 days. So this guy did it literally two weeks faster, 3,234 miles, 132,000 feet in elevation change, mm -hmm. running more than 50 miles a day, basically along for, I think for the majority of this run along Route 50. Right. And raising money for World Vision, trying to provide clean drinking water to the developed world. So that's pretty cool. My Shout favorite, out to my, Mike. My favorite anecdote was the stray dog that came upon them in Missouri. Yeah. Uh, and they named him Yellow. I guess it must have been a Yellow Lab and ran alongside them for 40 miles. That's a pretty cool story. It's a cool story. 40 miles. Yeah. And I like how this story was picked up by People Magazine. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, look He's at that. got such a happy vibe. Like I, I loved, I loved reading about him today. It's like, it's like the perfect. It's actually the perfect thing to wash down the world with. So uh, I would definitely click on this, you guys, in the show notes. Yeah, I like how in the People magazine article at the bottom it says related video: twelve-year-old golden retriever returns to Boston Marathon <laughs> after miraculously surviving tumor. We need more good news like that. Yeah, look we do. That, we need, that, you're dog. saying there needs to be more cat videos is what you're saying. We need more cat videos. I'm, I'm down with that. More and cat Here's uh, the Washington Post did an article on him too. He lives in he lives in Arlington, my old stomping grounds in the metropolitan Washington, D.C. area. That's right. So anyway, good on you, buddy. Did you grow up in, you, where did you grow? You were Silver Spring, right? In Bethesda. Bethesda. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man. Been there. I think Mike also ran the the perimeter of Beltway, which is like okay. 90 miles. Like he's done some other cool stuff. I've been there too. Name oh another gosh. place. Name another place. Just name a place. We're not playing. Just name one Look, place. We all know one you're place. the Lonely Planet guy. One place. What's the loneliest place on the planet that you've been? Oh. Um, the loneliest place on the planet. Here's I've Mike with his wife and kids and dogs. See, like what's not to love about this dude? I know. Um, the only loneliest place on planet I've ever been, Rich, is in my own head. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> That's the best answer. <laughs> All right. Um, moving on. So much news from the world of ultra endurance. Oh yeah, like we got we got like um, a we, stacked we agenda. Still have so much more to get through. So let's take a quick break, and we'll be back. We'll be back with news from the Hard Rock 100, from Badwater. Uh, and then we got some heavier stuff to cover, some listener questions and more. Cool. Let's sell some products. 
Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome, but I wanna snag a moment to talk to you about the importance of nutrition. The thing is, most people I know actually already know how to eat better and aspire to incorporate more whole plants, more fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily routine. Sadly, however, without the kitchen tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. So because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly and because I want everybody to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. The solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of highly customizable, super delicious and easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery and you get access to our amazing team of nutrition coaches seven days a week and many other features. To learn more and to sign up, visit meals.richroll.com. And right now for a limited time, we're offering $10 off an annual membership when you use the promo code RRHealth at checkout. This is life-changing stuff, people, for just $1.70 a week, literally the price of a cup of coffee. Again, that's meals.richroll.com, promo code RRHealth for $10 off an annual membership. All right, let's get back to the show. All right, we're back. We got news from the Hard Rock 100. Lay it on me. So the Hard Rock 100 is one of the most prestigious and difficult ultra races in the world. Uh, it is this loop that, that kind of traverses Southern Colorado, San Juan, San Juan Range. Oh. It has 66,000 feet of elevation gain. I've been there. And this is like a showdown race. Every like year. Durango out of Durango? Tell your ride, Durango, yeah. Silverton. Yeah. I think it starts and ends in Silverton. Yeah. One year they go clockwise, one year they go counterclockwise. Um, Francois Den, who I referenced earlier this year, he won it last year uh, and um, broke Killian Journey's course record. And he was returning this year to defend his title. Super cool guy originally hailing from the Beaujolais region of France. He oh. was a vintner, like making his own wine. He gave, really? me, he gave me a bottle of his wine. I didn't have a heart to tell him that I don't drink. Right. Uh, but super If only cool. your co-host He's since moved more to the mountains, but right. just a really sweet guy, family guy with kids. Cool. Who's this unbelievable ultra athlete, also super tall for a an ultra runner. How cool is that? Yeah, very cool yeah. dude um, who's just crushing it right now. Francois he's also. Dehan. I think he's won UTMB five times. Like everyone knows Killian Journey, but not as many people, particularly in North America, are familiar with Francois, but he's just an unreal talent. What's, how do you pronounce his last name? Den. Den, okay. Dehane. Dehane would be the Francois butchering Den. of it, but I think Francois Den. Den. Francois Den. Francois, that's good. Uh, that's very good. And uh, so it's gonna be a showdown between Francois and Killian. And uh, they, right out of the gate, pretty much ran together throughout the majority of the race, along with this um, other amazing athlete, Dakota Jones. They ran as a threesome. Yep. Kind of trading lead. I think Dakota was out in front for quite some time, but ultimately uh, Killian prevailed. Francois was second. Killian broke Francois's record and was crowned the victor for the fifth time at this race. He Unbelievable. Ran 21 hours, 36 minutes. Uh, Francois's record was 21.45 set last year. And Francois ran 21.51. So it's crazy that in a race this long, with this minutes. much elevation gain, that literally, you know, only a couple minutes separated, minutes separated them. And Dakota ended up third in 23.06. In addition, uh, Courtney DeWalter finally conquered this race, mm. uh, was the first to cross the finish line in the women's category. And it's also the first time that she's actually finished the race. Last year, she ran into digestive problems that sidelined her. And of course, as is Courtney's want, broke the women's course record running 26 hours, 44 minutes. I think she was sixth overall. I could be wrong about that. Um, but just kind of unbelievable, unbelievable. performances unbelievable, uh, around, uh, you know, all the way across the board. In second place was Stephanie Case, who ran 33.52. So that gives you a sense of just how much faster 
Courtney is and everyone else, mm -hmm. because whereas the men's race was fairly tight, right. um, Courtney won by a significant margin. And Hannah Green came in third at 34 hours, 26 minutes. But epic race uh, and very cool to see that. I, I think ultra running needs like a rivalry like this. I think these guys are friends and they get along really right. well. But um, cool to see you know, two athletes really at the top of their game, like going tete-a-tete -tete for, you know, almost 24 hours, Unbelievable. 21 hours, Unbelievable. Um, which is cool. Yes. And then the same weekend, the Badwater 135 went down. Is it always um, like that? Is Hard Rock and Badwater always on the same weekend? I don't know. That's a good question. Yeah. I should know the answer to that. I don't. I don't think they're generally I mean, I was surprised to see them on the same weekend. So... This is 135 miles through Death Valley and, and uh, up the Mount Whitney portals. Everyone knows it, knows about it being like, you know, the, the race that's in the hottest place on earth. Temperatures can reach around 120 degrees. There are stories of um, shoe soles melting on the pavement, et cetera. Yeah. But there's also an unbelievable amount of elevation gain. Yeah. And that last 13 miles, when you're going up the portals, you've probably been up there, right? Well, like, I've been there. It's steep. Yeah. Like you're literally going straight uphill. Yes. For the last half minute. I can't imagine. I can't imagine running of that this insane race. Or even walking it. Um, Harvey Lewis, friend of the pod, uh, won it last year. Um, he came in. What he got? He got what? He got fourth this year, I think. Right. Um, I don't want to get that wrong. Uh, yeah, he finished his 11th Badwater in fourth place. He ran 27 hours, 16 minutes. Unbelievable. Um, but really cool. His partner, Kelly O'Dell, completed her first Badwater in 46 hours and 57 minutes. There's a 48-hour cutoff. Yes. So she made it you know, within an hour of that 48-hour cutoff, which is really cool. Um, but the winner was the course record holder, uh, Yoshihiko Ishikawa, who won mm -hmm. for the second time. He negative split the course, which is unbelievable, running 23 hours and eight minutes. Um, he set the course record in 2019 with 21 hours, 33 wow. minutes. And the legend there is that when he crossed the finish line, he proposed to his girlfriend. So that's pretty Aww. cool. Um, that's how you do it. Where it gets interesting here. Win Badwater and then say, and then marry, propose. Me, marry me, my darling. You better hope she says yes. If you win Badwater. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, they're gonna say yeah. yes. Where this whole story gets interesting is, is in the women's race. Mm -hmm. So Ashley Paulson, who's a professional triathlete and a pretty well-known iFit instructor, um, set the new female course record uh, with, with a bit of a question mark. There's a, there's a sort of, let's just say there's a little controversy swirling around. I read this about athlete. this, yes. So she ran 24 hours and nine minutes. She's coached by Ryan Hall. She got third overall, so one place ahead of Harvey. And she beat the course record by a little bit under four minutes. But the controversy um, is sort of multifold. And it begins with uh, a six-month USADA ban that she received when she was a triathlete testing positive for something called Osterine, which is a selective androgen receptor modulator, an SARM. She's held firm on her innocence um, so that was, you know, look, that was seven years ago, six years ago. Um, but there's also been past allegations of course cutting. There was a half marathon where there's a lot of kind of controversy around her, her finishing time. Uh, in this particular Badwater, she had an unbelievable finishing split that sort of defies logic. Yeah, I and think, I think some, only one of the fastest in the last, you know, several years, only one of among one, the men. one man. If you look at that, lat, which yeah. is the hardest part, like we said, 13 miles right. up the portals. Like Ishikawa was slower than her and, and, uh, and, and um, Harvey Lewis is everyone except for one guy has, has beaten that time over the past, I think the last mm -hmm. 20 uh, male fastest times or something like that. There was yeah. a, there's a graph on that. And apparently there were some observations on the course and now there's an investigation underway. There's a website called Marathon Investigation where there's a post all about this, uh, which I'll link up into the show notes. So this is, you know, look, yeah. more will be revealed here. It's unclear exactly what transpired. All I'm saying is that there are some questions being asked about her performance and there are people who are trying to get to the bottom of it.
on her Instagram, she posted something about like, I'm posting my Garmin data. Like she's aware that there's controversy and yes. obviously, and, and she's, you know, defending herself. So, yeah, at this point, I don't, I don't know. I wasn't there. All I know is that here is this article and take it for what it, you know, what you wish. Here's the, if you're watching on YouTube, here's the list of splits go. for that last sec. Yeah, like of the faster race. than Scott Jurek, you know. Yeah, it's like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's just, you know, it's reasonable to be asking questions right yep. now. And, you know, in the event that something untoward happened, it's just disappointing. Like this is, you know, one thing that's so beautiful about the ultra running world and community is there is a certain kind of, you know, purity to it and not to be in, in you know, a sort of a, Aubrey Brundage, you know, purist on right. amateurism. Right, you know? uh, you're very Aubrey it's Brundage not, yeah. right now. It's, uh, you know, there is something kind of, it, you know, there's no, it's not like prize money or anything like right. that. Like, you know, people are doing this for the love. And so- You're to, revoking her license, her Badwater license, if, if, I'm if, doing nothing of if. the sort. <laughs> Camille Heron, another friend of the pod has weighed in on this as well. You can see her comments in this, in this uh, blog post on marathoninvestigation.com as well. Um, yeah, so kind of, you know, podcast roundup with Francois, Killian, Courtney, Harvey Lewis, Camille Heron, all of these names coming up, all all past, you know, past guests on the podcast, popular past guests, podcast guests in the past. Right. Which is cool, right? Yeah, I mean, that's this is the bread and butter, baby. Yeah. Um, we were going to talk about the Tour de France, but I got to tell you, I'm not enough up to speed. Right. I'm not COVID. either. I'm I, not either. My attention was devoted elsewhere. So maybe next time uh, we can chime in with some thoughts there. The only thing I'll say is that my new favorite rider is Magnus Court, the Dane with the mustache, who's oh. just crushing it early into the polka dot jer jersey and just continued to be in breakaways and winning stages with flair on the EF team. I love that guy. But just the other day, he got COVID, had to drop out of the Tour de France. Damn. And that's kind of the end of my Tour de France commentary for now. COVID. COVID on the tour. COVID's never, it just keeps going. I know. Um, should we weigh into the sticky waters of our main topic today, which we've we've promised not to spend more than five or six minutes on? Six minutes, three minutes <laughs> each. Actually, four minutes you decided, for you. You just randomly Two decided minutes six me. minutes was the limit for this? I randomly decided because when we were talking about it, you were like, it's been a while, but we should say something. We have discussed this in the yeah. past when the leak happened that this was going to go down. Um, we had a longer discussion about it. And, and we're of course, talking and, about the Dobbs case and the overturning of Roe versus Ro Wade. Roe versus Wade. And the clock Sorry. is ticking. So go, Adam. Okay. Clarence Thomas seems cool. <laughs> right? Am I right? Um, <laughs> I'm like, my reaction. You think he's a good hang? <laughs> he's a cool hang. Um, so on the one hand, I want, you know, when I heard about this, all I want to do is listen to uh, Lily Allen sing, fuck you. You know, your point of view is medieval. Fuck you very, very much. We hate you and we hate your whole crew. That kind of song. You know that mm -hmm. song? It's a great song. Um, but hate will not win this fight. And what we're dealing with are people, boots on the ground, people who th really do think they are saving babies' lives. They do. Um, sure. I, I don't agree with that perspective. I think it's a skewed perspective. Everyone loves babies on both sides of this fight. It's, 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 it, there's something grotesque about trying to, to suggest that, that uh, one group of people likes babies more. It's ridiculous. Um, but um, that said, that is their point of view. So like we, you know, and I, we need to be able to meet that with love as well. And we have to understand that. So, you know, they're unified in their purpose. They are outnumbered and yet still manage to get this through. Um, and we can't even decide that this is, we can't even say out loud that this is a women's rights issue because there was someone who was mm -hmm. testifying in front of Josh Hawley and made Josh Hawley seem reasonable, um, saying that it's not a woman's issue. Of course, it's a woman's issue because of uh, certain words that are supposed to be said. We can't even say that. So that's why we're getting beat. Um, and it's it's upsetting. Um, I was listening to Diggable Planets lately, 1993 mm -hmm. album. Throwback. Uh, throwback album. Uh, La Femme Fatale is a song on that record. Um, and here's a lyric. If Roe v. Wade was overturned, would not the desire remain intact, leaving young girls to risk their healths, 
doctors to botch and watch as they kill themselves. That's what we're dealing with. That was a 1993 album. Uh, Clarence Thomas is name checked in that as an enemy of Roe. Um, and, and it's come to fruition. That shows you how long people who wanted to overturn Roe v. Wade have been working. And they've been working even longer than that. I think you're gonna get into it. Um, mm -hmm. The one thing of the links that you shared with me is that I didn't realize kind of Clarence Thomas's motivation and, and going back. I think that's a really interesting story about um, how he was actually a, a, a black radical. Um, Very uh, influenced by Malcolm X, yeah. which is you know not what you would suspect. Yeah, and he he ended up on the, in the conservative wing of things because of his distest for white liberals uh, like ourselves, but mostly white liberals who are kind of giving uh, more like weren't really out to change anything, but were more out to make it less bad. Uh, at least that's what this article kind of is written by, I think Col uh, Columbia law professors. It's a very mm -hmm. interesting opinion piece. I, I highly recommend it. It was, it was very eye opening. It's important to know where people are coming from, but in the end, what it, this comes down to a human rights issue. And, you know, on the one hand, uh, you can't tell people not to carry a gun. You, you can't tell people to wear a mask, but you can tell women what to do if they get pregnant by rape. I mean, it's it's grotesque. Mm -hmm. Yeah, another interesting uh, kind of nuance to this article is the extent to which the left has attacked Thomas in you know a pretty bald faced racist way, right? Yeah, the the, the party who's meant to be for. Um, the expansion of human rights, like sort of defaulting to some, you know, not, not so great behavior. Phrasings, tactics. yes. Yeah. But yeah, listen, you know, I'm, I'm pro-choice. I believe in a woman's right to choose. I think this decision is wrongheaded for a multitude of reasons. And it's dispiriting and, and disappointing and, and frightening. Um, but I think it's important to understand the context in which this exists. It is in many ways, the culmination of you know, a 50 year campaign to undo Roe versus Wade. And they have succeeded in that by having a very long-term strategy that dates all the way back to the 1970s. And I think what is truly fascinating about all of this is the history behind the anti-abortion movement. Mm. Um, I sort of always assumed that the Christian right or the kind of evangelical uh, population of this country has historically and always been anti-abortion, but that's actually not the case. There's a really amazing article in on Politico about um, this history. Uh, it's called the religious right and the abortion myth. And it, it really unearths the beginning of conservative activism in this, uh, in this terrain. And it, basically what happened was that in the 1970s, these evangelical churches were attempting to double down on segregation. And in response, the IRS was going after them with the one tool that they have, which is to revoke their tax exempt status to sort of strong arm churches to abandon their segregationist policies. And in response, evangelicals realized that doubling down on, on segregation probably wasn't gonna win hearts and minds right. and, and, and allow them to avoid the you know, IRS's strategy of revoking their tax exempt status. So what did they do? They end up changing the narrative. They flip the script and they make it all about government intrusion. And they're the kind of tip of the spear for that government intrusion narrative was adopting anti-abortion as the cause to rally their base and garner support. And they were very successful in doing that because prior to that, where it gets fascinating is that prior to the 1970s, the church and we're setting Catholics aside actually cared very little about abortion. And as the history kind of bears out, they supported it in many, if not most cases. Right. This was not a thing right. until this IRS you know, kind of That's the whole point. Situation. It's, like, it's like the reason people think they're saving lives of babies is because they've been convinced of that. It's not, it's, and, and, and that starts here. That's where this comes from. Mm -hmm. This idea that like that, that's how they whipped people up into, into a frenzy to, and it's funny that they did this to avoid government intrusion into their affairs. That's nice. 
Yeah, it's super interesting, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the irony there yeah. is, is, is pretty palpable. So here we are, um, you know, it's retrograde in so many ways. Oh, and, yeah. uh, you know, it's, I don't even know where to begin. Uh, we've already, you know, sort of eclipsed our six minutes, but there's plenty more to say about this before we move on. I think it's going to be really interesting, like how this gets played out and how it will ultimately end up getting enforced state by state, right? I think, um, you know, obviously if you're well healed, you're going to be able to get access to an abortion. Yeah. If you're in a red state or a state where it's outlawed and it's difficult, we're already seeing situations in which women are being persecuted, medical practitioners are being persecuted, and the kind of next culture war is how are we going to regulate and police the abortion pill? Because a huge percentage of abortions carried out in the US and, and internationally is via this abortion pill, which is a two pill regimen. The first is a hormone blocker to kind of arrest the conception. And the second is what causes the discharge or the hemorrhage. And that pill is by prescription. And um, right now there are um, kind of online telehealth sources for that that are overseas, that are in states where it's legal. So what's gonna happen when all of this goes into effect and in many places it already has, how are, you know, what is, what is access to those pills gonna look like and how are states going to enforce or regulate that access? Is, is are they gonna possible? go after the women? Like I, it's not possible, right. right? So we're gonna enter this weird prohibition era type situation where either people are gonna be, you know, kind of under the table trafficking in this stuff or there, there really will be a true black market, but networks are gonna get set up to provide people with access to this. And I think a very likely scenario is that um, a lot of women will end up, and I'm not recommending this, but they'll be able to get access to that second pill because it's prescribed for ulcers. Mm. And if you go to your doctor and say you have an ulcer, you can get the second one. And there seems to be some efficacy um, in using just the second pill without the first. If you do it within the first 10 weeks, I think is the window, Yeah, but not recommended, right? So we're gonna enter that era of, you know, kind of, backroom dubious practices that are driven out of desperation. Re-enter that r realm. Yeah, re-enter, of um, course. Yeah. Yeah, I mean it's 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 uh it's people it's are not gonna stop having sex. No. And there's there, you know, <laughs> they're not, not gonna know stop. Of. There's not, you know, there's not gonna be a halt to unwanted pregnancies. No, they happen. And and we don't it's not like this is being met with uh an increase in funding and intentionality going into federal and state programs to you know support children who are born in such circumstances or mothers who are in a predicament of having to suddenly raise a child that they didn't really want to raise no because the people that are in favor of these kinds of anti-choice measures also are anti-welfare state stuff so you're never going to see that you're never going to concern see. ends with birth yeah and um it's interesting. Like there could be some weird cases that come up. Do you see that that woman who was in a carpool lane, pregnant, and got pulled over by a Texas? Oh uh, yeah, you share that with me. State Explain that trooper or something. Yeah. <laughs> and she said, "He's like, where's the where's the second person?" She pointed at her belly, and basically she now has a line because she was using that same legal argument, which is that, personhood, that, that it, personhood of of the fetus. And so she technically could get out of it on right. personhood. She was in the, the HOV lane, yeah. right? The yeah. carpool lane. Yeah. So, you know, pregnant women. And the women, cop was not having pregnant it. Mothers but she's like, can... either this is a person in my belly or it's not. Right. If so, it's not, then, then that there goes upends your... the entire argument right. around. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. So that kind of stuff could happen. Um, I like Malcolm, go, bring it back to Malcolm. His yeah. take on this is basically that we have this, the, the Supreme Court is um, unchecked. They have too long a life. Um, you need term limits. Uh, Ezra Klein had an 18 year term limit suggestion right. in his article, which is what gave rise to Malcolm writing about this in his newsletter, OMG, which is, I, I recommend it. It's a fun yeah. read. OH comma MG. Yeah. It's and it's always clever. a quick and fun read and, and educational. This one is, he thinks that every year, the longest tenured judge should have to retire, or I guess it wouldn't be called retired, be stand down 
and then whoever's uh, whatever president is is in power can appoint the next and the senate same kind of structure mm-hmm. to a point but then that gives a nine-year term limit basically by definition yeah. which in his mind is you know it it it, it offers that kind of depolitization they're not necessarily a creature of the political cycle because this idea that they are removed from the political cycle now is obviously bullshit we've seen it now right so and malcolm so, goes through yeah. like the multiple times throughout the majority opinion that they make clear that they're not you know beholden to yeah. political interests yeah. it's sort of a he doth protest too much type of yes, thing yes, like yes so it's hard to imagine um a counter argument to that, like the wisdom of term limits seems to make sense. Well, the ar- counter argument is it was in the constitution. I mean, that's all anyone right. ever wants to say. But let's, so. come on. I mean, the idea, I, I just, I can't stand this idea that we're, we're trying to read the minds of people who lived in a world that looks nothing like ours and people who couldn't conceive of what, you know, type of problems we would face and the complexity of the culture as it exists today. And I think, Certainly we can extract principles and tenets that hold true, um, that provide, you know, kind of the architecture of the constitution. But but when we get into strict constructionist mind reading, I think we're really having to do some crazy gymnastics in order for, you know, our agenda to kind of fit what these people might or might not have imagined. And that applies to Second Amendment issues, et cetera, and all the way down the line. You know what, Rich? Those are fighting words, and I'm going to go get my musket. I'll be right back. Right. I mean, when the 14th Amendment was passed, are you supposed to think about what they were thinking in 17... 17- 80 whatever, or at the time that the 14th Amendment was passed. There were more liberal you know, people like, in 1480. I'm, I'm sure we can find more liberal people than, than Alito know. in 1480. Listen, the people who were setting up house in Jamestown were some serious wackos. That's the whole point. Like this country, like th- this know. idea that we've regressed though is funny. We have regressed, but it's like, it's not like this stuff wasn't handwriting on the wall. Like the pe- the Puritans who came to Massachusetts were kicked out of England because they were making everyone stop drinking and having fun and like burning down the Globe Theater. It's like mm-hmm. nobody wanted them there anymore. And so then they came to Boston. It's <laughs> <laughs> the truth. I know. It's pretty funny when you think of it that <laughs> yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the truth. Uh, well, you mentioned digi- diggable, diggable planets. Yes, speaking uh, of that's diggable a, that's planets. That's a good, you know, uh, natural segue as yes. was my other segue into uh, the web telescope images. I love it. What did you make of all this? Man, I loved it. I loved seeing those photos. Um, I'm a big Karina Nebula guy now. By the Space way, we cliffs. I think we went for like 18 minutes on the abortion thing. Go ahead. It's because yeah, it's probably right. my fault. They're, everyone's going to blame me anyway. All your political opinions get blamed on me. <laughs> no. There might be a little bit of that. <laughs> I get um, I get a fair amount of blame. Listen, you can't talk about that subject matter without people getting upset. Right. And we, we're supposed to be able to be grownups. Um, this was great. You know, I loved the um the I think is it Shannon Sterone, the uh the opinion piece, um the tele the, about the extraordinary images. I love uh, that piece. Oh, yeah, it's this, right this, here. Shocking and awe at the universe together. Yeah, she wrote that um you know, this is like one of those things where we can, yeah, it's like a public, uh, we're all together watching this thing and it's a good thing and it's a positive thing and how rare are those? I mean, that's why I love writing stories about um, people pushing human limits and successful ones at that uh, because it, they are f- they are good, inspiring stories and we need those. So this is another one of those and the images are just tremendous and, and spectacular. And like, it just shows you how how glorious the world is. Mm-hmm. and the universe is. Is this the one thing we can all agree on? Are there are there debates going on right now? Divisive debates about this? I don't like, know, It man. does I feel mean, pretty unifying. Like if, if this can't unify us, I, I really, I don't know. Think about it. It's like a collaboration do. among NASA, European Space Agency, Canadian Space Agency. I mean, na- na- like NASA, like the International Space Station is often, um, uh, you know, held down by Russia. We were sending people for like American astronauts from Russia. Like the space area is the one place we can all agree on. And mm-hmm. Elon will find life in outer space. He will. Yeah. If he can get out of this Twitter contract. <laughs> we'll see about whether he can. He's trying hard. <laughs> but 
lawsuits are afoot. <laughs> they might hold his hand to the flame this time. I well, think that'll end up settling. How did this land for you? You were deep in second COVID when this was going on. I right? was. Yeah. I mean, listen, it's hard to it's hard to you know look at the, those images and not just be inspired with awe and wonder and humility. The thing that really got me um, was the the paragraph. Um, I think it's on the NASA site where they say for a sense of scale, like if you take that main image, yeah. like you can see it on the screen right there, the one that got shared first. The Shannon wrote this one that you're talking about, yeah. Oh yeah, for yeah. a sense of, if you could hold a grain of sand at arm's length up to the sky, that speck is the size of the view. In other words, everything that you see in that image, which is so much, mm. can be held in that grain of sand. And then there's everything else. So it's, it is one minuscule sliver of our universe filled with thousands of galaxies, each with billions or trillions of star systems, and each of those with its own planets. I mean, it's so hard to, you it's can hard. read that and you can try to intellectualize it, but right. the numbers are so big yeah. that you can't grasp it. And it's only in seeing an image like that, that's so crisp and detailed that you can begin to kind of grapple with the vastness of scale. And I don't know, you know, I look at that and I just think there's no way we're alone. Like, how could it be possible that we're alone? Where's Dune? Which one's Dune? <laughs> Which one's Dune? <laughs> you mean the sand dune in Malibu? <laughs> <laughs> Which one's Dune? Where's the spice? <laughs> where's and the dude? worms. Where's the where's the worm planet? Um, and then that's not even getting into the fact that like you're looking back in time. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. so our brains aren't, we can't understand that what that means. We like, can't. oh, oh we what can. you're seeing is that's billions of years ago. Yeah. And it's far away. But it's 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 you know, it's just it like that that's why you said you said that when you were feeling depressed, like uh, feeling insignificant or whatever. Um, that's what I mean by it. Like that's, that's the, that's where feeling insignificant is a positive thing, right? Like yeah. the humility aspect of it, but also just the fact that you're, you are just this one note in a concerto. And it's like, it, it's a beautiful thing to think of yourself that way. It's freeing. It's, it's liberating. I don't find that depressing at all. No. I find that to be, you know, calming. Yeah. And like your problems are as, are smaller than that grain of sand because you're a grain of sand. <laughs> so nobody really yeah. cares. So why are you caring so much? You know, yeah. like, and that's not to say to not take your life seriously or not take yourself seriously or or um, contend with your with your own issues. I, I think you should, but but the stakes we often put upon ourselves are, and the pressure is so high, and it doesn't have to always be that way. You know what I say, Adam? What I say, Cory Booker, look out. Because Adam Skolnick is coming for, coming for your crown, <laughs> your inspirational self-help guru Wait, crown. What? No. Yeah. No. You just delivered an, an awesome monologue. I, I, I delivered a rich how to roll. Think about it. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I opened a can of rich Clip roll. Clip that. I opened a can of rich roll. On There's you. your reel for Instagram. <laughs> See if I can get Camiola to cut it. I love the. I love these web images. I mean, it's it's really just absolutely stunning. Cool. And uh, yeah, man, it's cool. It's cool that we live in a time where stuff like this is coming out. You know what I, f I stumbled upon? I was at the, um, not the, what's the, what's the, what's the uh, museum down in, uh, in Westwood? The, uh, you know what I mean? The, the oh, art museum yeah, yeah, yeah. in Westwood. Not this hammer, was just the hammer, there, the hammer. The hammer. Yeah. Isn't and there I was, a Barbara Kruger exhibit there right now? Yeah, there's something going on and there's like a, a moon oh, thing. I, 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 we were at this, uh, I just went, stopped into the gift shop. I love a museum gift shop. Who doesn't love a museum gift shop? The best gift shops. The best gift shops. Are there's museums. always some kind of weird clock. You know, yeah. They're always trying to reinvent the clock. <laughs> and the clocks are completely useless yeah. now. Uh, but uh, I picked up this cool uh, book. I'll, bring, I'll show it to you, but it's, it's, it's basically all these from from all the Apollo uh, expeditions, all the Apollo missions, the photographs taken by the astronauts themselves, and and then edited in a certain way, and with like kind of excerpts and 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 writings from um, E. B. White, who was covering mm -hmm. the Apollo missions for the New Yorker at the time. He's got he's got one essay in there, and then there's other writings. Um, but it's just so cool to see these images of the moon, like a moon rock in the moon desert. You know, the Earth rising yeah. above the moon. And it just makes me feel, you know, feel, feel so good. And watching when Zuma looks up at the moon, it's like the greatest thing in the world, right? You know, it's yeah. like that simple, simple stuff. So like something about space just still hits us hard. I love it. Hard. Yeah. I mean, you know, as, as we talked about earlier, I grew up in the Washington DC area 
in Bethesda, which is a suburb of Washington. Um, and I still remember when the, the Air and Space Museum opened and what a mm. big deal that was and how mm. cool it was to go there. And at that time, there was no, the, sub, the subway didn't reach all the way out to Bethesda. Um, but when it finally did, then I could take the subway as like a young person and go to the Air and Space Museum with my friend, like as young people, like without parents. And I used to go there like all the time. Like I have that museum like imprinted in my long-term memory. Oh. I just loved it so much. Yeah. Oh, a little rich roll, yeah. roll rocking I around the it. museum. They had a Star Trek exhibit yeah. and then like, you know, the, the lunar lander and the spirit of St. Louis. Yeah. The original uh, Eames film, Powers of Ten. Yeah. You know that movie? Where yeah. You, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like I just, oh man. It was very influential on me as a young person. Still cool. my favorite museum. Let's just go be astronauts, huh? <laughs> Let's just leave this behind. Are you into, where, are you into uh, For All Mankind on Apple Plus TV? Which one is that? Is that the one with the one where um, they go, Jared Harris? It's the alternate no. universe where the Russians win the space race and then kind of what happens as a result of that. So no. it's by Ronald Moore, the guy who created Battlestar Galactica. No. And I think they're on season three now. It's a pretty cool show. If you're into space I have not, I have not, I have not seen that. I did just rewatch Point Break. You have do. you heard of that film? I have. It's a great Bodhi. film. <laughs> Bodhi, short for Bodhisattva. <laughs> yeah. um, and uh, I, I watched that. Does it hold up? It's so good, dude. It's so good, yet not good. But that's but what that's makes what it makes good. it good. Yeah. All I can say is I'm going to watch everything Anthony Kiedis is in from now on. I, I forgot how great he how is many? in the movie. <laughs> I love him. He's probably in a bunch of movies and cameos. Yeah, I, I'm going to start watching him. Yeah, that's funny. He, nobody. He he's he he gets he gets shot in it. He's so good. It's, he's perfect. He's How's perfect. Keanu? Listen, man. I love Keanu Reeves. Don't don't come at my guy. Don't come at unless you have Keanu positive Reeves. things to I say. I love Keanu Reeves. I also think Patrick Swayze put on an epic performance. He's amazing. Un underrated master. Yes. Of the uh, cinematic arts. Yes. I heard a rumor that he got so into skydiving that that exit is actually his exit. He um he did like he got super into it during the filming and did a lot of it and like he's literally skydiving himself doing stunts. So that's pretty cool. Mm. Maybe we should do a whole episode breakdown of Point Break. I was wondering, did, did Rewatchables <laughs> do Point Break? They had to have. They had to That's have. a good question. If they, they haven't, have. it would be shocking if they haven't. Not recently, maybe way back in the archive. I can't imagine they have it. I mean, that's right up Bill Simmons' alley. But that end when, when Keanu uh, is satisfied that, that he's going to get Bodhi or Bodhi will get got by the uh, huge swell at Bell's Beach and he just tosses his FBI... Uh, badge aside into the shallows. And he's like, I'm done with this bullshit. I was thinking in real life, you keep that badge until you get to US customs, you get through customs. Only then do you toss, because there's no, remember, keep in mind, this is a long time ago. There's no- Pre 9-11. Uh, yeah, it's pre 9-11. So there, and, and there's no, what's it called? The global global entry, no global entry. So you have to wait in that line. Trust me, you hold on to that badge yeah, but until it's you get Keanu, stateside. one phone call. Don't overthink it. It's not Keanu. It's an FBI agent. Right. It's, 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 what's his name? <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're done talking about that. Okay. Sorry. Uh, but I do want to share one thing that I really enjoyed. Yeah. I, I binged this entire series while I was laying in bed with COVID, um, which is The Bear on FX. Yes. You've watched, have you watched the whole, all of I'm it? I'm seven out of eight. Done seven out of eight. We're, we're saving show, finales tonight. Is so fucking good. It's mm. my favorite new thing. It's good. And each episode is only is under 30 minutes. Like right. you can, there's I think there's eight episodes. I don't get commercials anymore. Yeah, you we were talking about this the other night. You're like, oh, I hate the commercials on Hulu. I'm I like, thought what are you I doing, thought, dude? I thought everyone got commercials. No. On Hulu. <laughs> you got that Goggins cash. You can pay six bucks a month or whatever it is, ten bucks a month. <laughs> No At comment. least for a limited time, you can cancel it later. <laughs> yes, 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 yes. I anyway, won't cancel it. I, I love the bear. Bear is a story of uh, uh, this this young chef mm -hmm. who goes to New York, chefs at you know under the greatest chef at the best restaurant in the world. Yeah, it, it, it would appear that he was a sous chef at Noma. They talk about Noma. Chef a bunch de cuisine, of times. I think. Chef, chef de, de cuisine. cuisine, just below executive chef. Right. Yeah. Um, there's cameos by the of the Noma cookbook yep. and the um, Noma fermentation book, which was written by David Zilber, who's somebody that I've 
had the opportunity to meet and I've been to Noma. Uh, I love how they kind of make fun of 11 Madison Park too. Yes. But basically it's the story of this guy who was really on this trajectory towards chef superstardom. He, he was won best, a, best young. Ch- new he won a James Beard award, and right? And food and wine's best young new chef or something. And his older brother dies. His, his brother had a history with addiction and he moves home to Chicago and takes over the family owned sandwich shop. And Kills himself, the older and, brother, I think. Right, yeah, yeah. commits suicide. Yeah. Um, and he takes it upon himself to try to get this capsized enterprise back on its feet and perhaps even do something interesting there. Um, and it's sort of a comedy, it's sort of a drama. The performances are, are just off the charts. Jeremy Allen White as the chef. Eben Moss Bacharach as like, they call him the cousin. I think he's just like a friend who works there. He's kind of a hothead. He was like the best he, friend. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, of, my, of the of the b- older brother. Yeah. And then he had been running things in the absence when, like after it happened. So he he stayed in charge of basically, th- and sure. the chef came in and started ruffling his feathers basically. Right, and just crushes the Chicago accent. And he's, you had said he's like shades of a young Gary Oldman from State of Grace. I think I so. Think that's accurate. Yeah, not, not as maniacal as that because he's He's not a killer, but he's, uh, but certainly Flying off the, the, opera, the operatic. He acting. has the juicy part. Oh yeah, you yeah. Know? he's and amazing. He just absolutely crushes it. Amazing. Um, people would know him from Girls if you watch that show. Mm. He had a he had a part in Girls. He's a phenomenal and, uh, actor. And Oliver Platt's brother, or Oliver Platt, is is uh, has a great part in this as well. What's yep. interesting is that Oliver Platt's brother, Adam Platt, was uh, he just retired, but he was a food critic for many many years. He was the chief food critic for New York Magazine. And when I went to Noma with Jeff gordon I was yep. also with Adam Platt. Oh, okay. It's cool that like Adam's brother, Oliver, is in the show, which is about food. Um, yeah, Ol- Oliver Platt's never been better in my opinion. He's fantastic yeah. in this. Yeah. So I love everything about this show, uh, particularly episode seven. We don't need to get it. I want people to experience this show without us spoiling anything. But episode seven, just bear in mind, the entire episode is one shot. Uh, it's a tracking shot for all of 28 minutes or something like that. Yeah, something it's like that. unbelievable cinematic achievement. And the tension, the humor, the pathos, like everything about this is just wonderful and exactly what you would want from the best of what television has to offer. What about uh, the fact that it's like, I mean, for your, not for your listeners or whatever, but it's all about, it's basically a French dip restaurant, right? Like that's, it's like a, it's like a steak. It's like a, it's like a roast beef sandwich and hot dog joint. Yeah. I mean, it's a classic hole in the wall, Chicken. family yeah. owned, you know, sandwich shop, so do neighborhood those, sandwich shop in Chicago. Right. Do those seared beef uh, images actually make you kind of like, do, you know how they're shot in a way to make I'm you- past it. I'm over it. You're past um, that? Yeah. Not even a but little I've had, bit. Uh, listen, I've spent my fair share of time in spots like that, particularly yeah. like Phil, you like you go out drinking, you're in Buffalo, yeah. or you're in Philly, yeah. and you want that cheesesteak yeah. late night. Yes. Like this is where you go. So right? here's my one critique of the show. Uh-oh. Come Why on. is it only open from three to 10? There is a weird thing about that. It, like, it's a sandwich shop. <laughs> like Philippe's downtown is open at like 9 a.m. or 7 a.m. or something like that. It does <laughs> seem that they don't open until like three o'clock or they, something. They open at three, they go three to 10. But is it possible that they have an earlier shift and then they close and no, then they I, reopen? No, in, in it is. Seven, there is, there is something, there is something the, weird about that. the hours that. and it says yeah. three to 10. This whole time, for the first I understand episodes. the late night, but they're not open until like two in the morning late. either. So uh, that's my whole thing. I was They I was, miss lunch. <laughs> and who wants a sandwich for dinner? Right, that's my point. No and then they're, they're not open when the bar's closed. No closed. wonder they're struggling. That's what I was saying. This whole time I was I was saying to, <laughs> to April, I'm like, but when when do they open? I, I couldn't figure it out. And she was like, and she couldn't figure it out. We couldn't. And so and now it's, right, it's they're well, open three to 10. Sorry, spoiler alert. They're open three to 10. There it is. Um, um, you know, it's been a good Blake, time for me to watch the, it. Pull up that page I just put up so people can see who, are, who have not heard of this show. Yes. Um, anyway. I it, love it. I love we can it overlook too. that. I do overlook it. I'm just joking, but I I love the fact that I've also been on a uh, Anthony Bourdain deep dive, mm. and so I just read yeah, Kitchen helps. Kitchen Confidential, which so interesting because it it there's the parallels with the chef and the, and the whole with the chefing and even the suicide angle and all that and the and and the misanthropic kind of undertones of it. Um, and the intensity. And, and the intensity. And the the collegiality, like the family yeah. aspect. Of, and the machismo of a kitchen mm-hmm. and all that, like, because that's that's deep in, in, in the kitchen confidential. And which is, a if you have only 
watch the television shows and you like Anthony Bourdain, I highly recommend. You will love the bear. It's, it's, and you'll love the bear. Yeah. And, and anyway, so just having watched that uh, at the time that I'm reading that book has been kind of fun, mm-hmm. you know, feedback. And they just got renewed for a second season. Of course. I mean, come on. Yeah. The performances in this show are fantastic. I think it's it, it almost, especially the first episode and episode seven, both of those, where there's so much of the entire cast in it at, all at once in mm-hmm. a tight, confined st- uh, space and talking over each other. It's almost like a play. Yeah, it, it, it's very theatrical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of these actors come from the theater. Right. Uh, anyway, I love it. I come high, from the theater. High theater. recommend to the you. Theater? To you. Yeah, I just was at the a theater, theater of down the, the street. The theater of the demented mind. <laughs> Thank you. That's All right. Me. Let's do some listener questions. We haven't oh, done shit. these in a long time. What? Listeners? They got interrupted by Cory Booker. Yeah, sorry, guys. This is Anna Grace from Charlottesville, Virginia. Hi, Rich and Adam. I'm Anna Grace. I'm from Charlottesville, Virginia, and I'm going into my fourth year of college here. I know that I want to do public service work in the international affairs area. A lot of your interview guests talk about the importance of prioritizing your own well-being and living a holistic life that isn't overly focused on gaining accolades or a narrow definition of success. However, it seems like a lot of them did have a very work and accolade-centric beginning of their career. And this is definitely something I feel a lot of pressure to do because the jobs where I feel that I can ultimately have the most impact kind of require it. Do you think that having a sort of very unbalanced and maybe unhealthy focus on work is a rite of passage to launch yourself into a position of impact? Or is there a better way to think about this for young people specifically? I'm curious to hear your thoughts. I really admire you both and thank you for all of the work that you do. Thank you. First of all, Anna Grace, great name. Very good name, right? Great question and great name. But Anna can, Grace. You, can and, you and I love the delivery. The delivery was right. fabulous. All I'm thinking, like I barely heard what she said, other than this thought that kept recurring in my mind, which is Adam, can you imagine being in your fourth year of college and thinking about things in the way that Anna is thinking about them in such a mature way? No, because I would be uh, like dropping acid or smoking <laughs> a bong rip. Yeah. I mean, first of all, like whatever I say almost doesn't matter, Anna, because like you're going to be fine. If this is where your head's at and you're kind That's of weighing point. these things in this way, you're already like miles down the road. Like you'll be fine. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, you'll I, figure it out. I, I, I think, <laughs> I think it's an incredible question because I don't even, yeah. you're right. I don't think people 10 years, 15 years older than her think like think things, things right. through. So just so the fact well. that you're asking yourself this question and yeah. trying to figure it out puts you in rare company. Yes. So let me just say that to begin with. Um, and then second to that, I think it's worth noting that you should be congratulated on having some conviction about what you want to do and, and how you want to do it and a sense of how to go about it in a healthy way, like again, speaks to your maturity and intelligence. And, you know, I think the way that I would launch into answering this is to first sort of acknowledge your youth. I mean, I assume as somebody who's in their fourth year of college, you're in your early twenties. And and I think of that time as a time for exploration, for gathering experiences, all kinds of different experiences, and a time where it makes sense to incur some risk, right? Mm-hmm. Like you don't have a mortgage, you don't have a family, you don't have dependents. It's a time in your life where you will be as free as you ever will be to try lots of things uh, without, you know, w- without having to really, you know, suffer any amazing consequences. Like this is the time for that. And I think in the context of what you want to pursue, which is public service in international affairs. What's interesting about that is that it is it is both specific and broad. Like it's specific in that like it's a kind of a thing in a certain type of area that you seem to be attracted to, wherein there is probably a very specific path for moving upward. But it's also pretty broad. And I think when you say international affairs, like that could be anything. And as somebody in your 20s, I immediately leap to like, we'll travel. Like immerse yourself in foreign cultures, be an international citizen. And I think long-term, even though that doesn't seem 
specifically wed to a particular career track, it will be extremely valuable as you progress in that world in terms of what you have to have to offer. So again, think about how you can accumulate experience in that field from that broad perspective, because within it, I suspect, I suspect that there are many jobs and paths, probably most of which you may not even be aware of at this juncture. Mm-hmm. On the work hard thing, that's a really interesting wrinkle to all of this because it is important to work hard, right? Like you cannot excel or, you know, kind of accelerate yourself into a lofty position without working hard. I think the key is being aware of your attachment to specific jobs and to specific outcomes and to learn how to hold those loosely to work hard and focus on the things that you can control, but to not get irrationally attached to any specific job or track or externalities like accolades, et cetera. Um, and again, you know, back to this idea of international affairs. I mean, that seems to me to be something that could be anything. It could be self-dictated. And right now, my advice would be that your job should really be a bit, a be about becoming internationally educated. Again, back to travel and experience and not getting caught up in externalities and, and to focus on like what excites you, what lights you up in the field of international affairs and to try lots of things and develop expertise in a variety of areas, a la David Epstein and his book, Range, which if you, if you have not read that book, you should certainly read it. Mm. And I think over time, all of those experiences will like sort of congeal and come into play uh, to uniquely situate you for the role that you ultimately want to play and, and, and might position you to be the only person in the world suitable for that specific thing because of the unique set of experiences that, that you've had. Um, and I think within that, it's important, you know, as a young person coming out of college, there's a sense of expediency. Like I gotta, I gotta move forward. I gotta climb the ladder. I'm missing out. People are getting ahead of me. Um, and I think you should really uh, just embrace the idea that you're at the beginning of a very long journey. And within that, you can kind of relax and prioritize self-care as important and valuable, but not to confuse that with laziness because you will have to work hard. Um, but I think that hard work should come within the context of a strategy uh, that relates to playing the long game. Like you can work hard and you can take care of yourself. They're not necessarily mutually exclusive or orthogonal ideas. And I think that's a mistake I see a lot of young people make. Like they rationalize laziness as self-care or as an excuse to not work hard. Because to be successful, you're going to have to work hard. Yes. Uh, But ultimate success means avoiding burnout and designing a life that aligns with your values over an extended period of time so that you can continue to get better at what it is that you do without burning out or without suffering the negative ramifications of like an unhealthy work schedule. And I think now is the best time to get clear on what that might look like and lay the foundation for that. Um, 100%. I, uh, that's so well done. You do these so well, these listener questions. I did, Can make, I say I that? did make notes. Can I say that? You do these well. <laughs> oh, um, you. I'm getting shades of Samantha Power in Anna Grace. You know what I'm saying? Samantha Power, the Obama ambassador to the UN, I believe. Uh, mm -hmm. And she wrote a book called The Education of an Idealist. And I heard her on, I think it was on uh, Terry Gross or something. And she's phenomenal. I wonder if if Anna has read that. Um, Listen, I I am someone who decided I wanted to write my way around the world. And I did that. Um, And I was able to do that because I, I, really did was single-minded in that pursuit. That doesn't mean I was the most, always the most work obsessed, but by the time I started doing it for a living, it did demand months at a time with no days off. So that kind of stuff does happen and you have short deadlines and you have to meet mm-hmm. them. And, 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 um, and so there are time, there's time and place for that kind of single-minded pursuit. And I think the idea of doing that young when you don't have the kind of the, the baggage that comes with, um, you know, just being older and ha- being more established, you, you you know, you're 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 sleek. You can move around. Sure. So I think, and you can make it fun. Yeah, you can make you it. You can should bust be your fun. ass, and if it is really what you love doing, it, there should be a significant aspect of it's that. It's going to be exhilarating. It's going to bring she, you joy, she, but also you're going to have to. You got to learn that with, when that's the case, you're even more in a danger zone because then you'll never take a break. Well, so 
Right. And, and you don't want to get to that point. But I think the great part about international life is that you're always, it's always, something's always happening. It's pretty and, sick. And, and, it's like yeah. Jason Bourne. You know? Yeah, it's pretty <laughs> awesome. And you're going to work hard. Yeah. And then you're, there's going to be opportunities to hang out and have fun and explore different places because it's all, you're international. I think the best piece of advice you gave is be international. And mm -hmm. that means learning languages, that you know you need you want to be bilingual learning maybe culture, trilingual learning language uh, yeah experiencing those cultures yeah. boots on the ground and if, understanding their politics and their history 100% and and that's the greatest piece of advice you gave and i think that i would i would say that like just go get lost go go to go to wherever you want to go and explore it and be part of it and um and you will not go wrong whatever comes out of that the other thing is you know it's funny how when you have this idea that you want to do or be something, then you kind of get there and then you realize how limiting that was and something else comes up. So like for me wanting to write my way around the world then after doing Lonely Planet book after and like basically doing that for seven, eight years, that's all I did. Um, I realized, well, that wasn't really the pinnacle of the craft of writing. And so I, I had other mm -hmm. uh, ambitions that kind of came of, up. That's part of growth. Right, so that's going to happen. So that idea of, holding things lightly. It's not just because, hey, it may not work out. It's actually because, hey, you might evolve mm -hmm. and your ambitions will evolve with you. And therefore, you know, it's okay to hold certain uh, destinations lightly in terms of, you know, career destinations because things could change for you too. So the, the idea that this is just an experience to, 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 to get the most out of and to dedicate yourself to it, whether it's, uh, you know, working 60 hours a week or not, um, I, I like that attitude. I see, I see success in yeah. Anna Grace's future. I, like I said, I'm not worried about, I'm not worried about Anna. No, she's going to be fine. She I'm will. jealous. <laughs> Sounds like she's getting ready for an awesome life. It's true. <laughs> All right. You want to go back in time. Yeah. You want to be rich roll I wanna, at 21. Yeah. Growing up in the greater Washington DC area, I was, I was in a perfect position to become a spy, an international spy. I had, a friend exactly, who, I had a friend. I had a friend whose dad was a CIA. Agent. That's exactly what an international spy would say. <laughs> what you just said <laughs> is it? <laughs> yes, I would be so good as a spy. All wink, along, wink. <laughs> that's what really has been happening. All right, let's move on. Let's move to Dan from Silver Spring. <laughs> Dan from Silver Spring, three hundred one Silver Spring. Get it back to DC, listener. You think you think this is. Dan from Silver Spring with a question, but really it's a message for his this operative. Is my, this is my handler, <laughs> my handler at Langley. He lives in Silver Spring. He works in Langley. He commutes. He commutes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Hey, Rich and Adam. This is Dan from Silver Spring, just outside DC. Rich, thanks for your passion. I'll be six years sober in September, and your show helps me stay on the path. But I wanted to call today and ask both of you about gratitude. You both talk about how important it is in your lives, and many of your guests have as well, most notably Tommy Ribs, who's a personal hero of mine as well. I have a lot to be grateful for. Sobriety, a loving wife who is my best friend, two kids who are hilarious and awesome, my health. I had a brain tumor removed a few years ago, and I'm back at running and hiking just like before. So there's a lot there. I'm having trouble grasping this idea, though. Every time I think about all of the things I have to be grateful for, it's kind of like, yeah, okay, things are good, cool. How do you guys embody gratitude? What am I missing here? And how do people like you and Adam and Tommy Ribs live that gratitude? Thanks so much, guys. Peace. I feel like that last sentence there is the cipher. Yeah, the radio. That will unlock the radio. how we decode the rest of this message. The radio. That shows, <laughs> yeah. that shows who yes. he really is. And dropping all these keywords, right? Yeah. Tommy Rives, gratitude. Mm -hmm. mm. What's gratitude I've really been found mean? out. Yeah, I've been discovered. Anyway, uh, this is a really good question, Dan. Thank you for that. And uh, I appreciate you sharing that story. Yeah. And obviously, you've gone through some really hard stuff and must have been really challenging to endure all of that. And you're on the other side of it and you're asking yourself the right question, right? Like, how can I connect more deeply with gratitude? My sense just from your tone of voice and the way that you kind of laid this question out is, is that, and I could be totally wrong, but it sounds like you're kind of living in your head and trying to intellectualize this idea of gratitude. Hmm. And perhaps that's 
serving to block you from just emotionally connecting with it because it's like this equation you're trying to solve with your mind as opposed to an allowing or a letting go that will open you up emotionally to this type of experience, which is hard to do. And I'm very sympathetic and, 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 and empathetic to that. Like gratitude is tricky. I've talked about this a lot on the podcast, as I've said many times, I don't naturally exude it. I'm petty, I'm competitive, I'm super jealous of Adam. I'm even more envious of Adam. Yeah. I'm grouchy. Yeah. I can be all entitled. True. All like, true. All, all of true. it. Right? All true. Yeah. Uh, and, and gratitude is just one modality, a powerful modality, a practice that can be deployed to keep those baser emotions at bay and help you connect with the things that are most important. And the tasks for cultivating it, again, as I've discussed many times, are multivariate. You could do a gratitude list writing down every single day before you go to bed or the minute you wake up in the morning, a list of 10 things that you're grateful for. Although that can be an intellectual exercise. And it sounds like maybe you have even tried that and it's mm. not working. Mm. And I get that too. Um, you can be of service to those in need. You can call up an old friend that you haven't spoken to before and tell him that you miss him or her. You can write a letter to somebody you care about. In other words, practicing the expression of gratitude aids in cultivating that sense within yourself. But I really hear what you have to say, Dan, because often in, in doing this myself, I find that connecting with gratitude is, is difficult, that it can be this intellectual pursuit that doesn't really pay off emotionally. And it's really a struggle to figure out how to feel it, like feel it with your body. Um, the way that I've been able to kind of turn the page and, and pull the covers on that is through mindfulness and meditation. Because I think the more that you can be present with yourself and opt out of the looping patterns of, patterns of your brain and just be at one with others, the environment, then the more attuned you can become to the emotional states that you're experiencing. And in particular, in this case, gratitude. And if you look at Tommy Rives, I think it's pretty clear that he's somebody who is very heart-centered, like he lives in his heart, not in his head. And, and as such is very adept at being able to connect with gratitude. Mm. Like myself, on the other hand, I have to really practice just to experience glimpses of it. But I do think it's possible and it does come more easily with a consistent practice. It is a practice of trying to strip away the non-essentials from your awareness. And in your case, I would say, you know, the, the intellectualization of not just this experience, but of probably a lot of things in your life and trying to move that awareness down into your heart and then giving of yourself freely, freely to other people with your attention, your time, your empathy. I think that breaks the chain of self-obsession that can come with intellectualizing or over-intellectualizing things. Um, and beyond that, you know, I don't know what else to tell them or tell you, Dan. Um, other than than that, and to continue to to pursue it because it is a worthwhile investment of your time and energy. Yeah, what do you think? I, I agree with you. I think um, what's worked for me is just this awareness of that the interconnectedness of all things. So, uh, you know, that's why I love getting in the ocean so often because to me that's like the physical expression of you know, you're you're now in this other world. And, and you're kind of taken out of your own head. You have to be. Um, and you're now just experiencing life as opposed to analyzing it at the same time. So, so much of us, all we're doing is analyzing all mm -hmm. the time. You know, we're not really you have to You have to interrupt that default yeah. mode yeah. state. Yeah. And I think, you know, for you, it's jumping in the ocean. Yeah. I mean, that works for me as yeah. well. You can look at those images from the web telescope. Yep. And for a lot of people, that insp inspires that sense of awe and wonder. 100%. Um, but for other people, they could look at that and say, that's cool, but I don't, you know, whatever. Right, but you, so it's, it's, a, it's an individual thing. And yeah. so I guess what you're saying and what I would suggest um, is that uh, Dan figure out the thing that does, you know, provide him with a sense of awe and wonder. When was the last time that he felt like a heart-centered, profound sense of awe and wonder and try to figure out ways of, of 
recapturing or or uh, recapitulating that experience in his life. Yeah, and the thing is, you can't force it, right? It's like it's like one of those things where, you know, if you're on the hiking trails, sitting down and and breathing to give yourself a chance to get there is a good way of saying it. like like yeah. mindfulness well, the breath meditation. Work, the right. breath work can be really powerful right. breath work modality as well. And meditation and just like looking at cloud formations and just kind of keeping it super simple um, is one way of doing it. But at the same time, I also empathize because, you know, when you hear it all the time when you're a father and your wife's about to give birth and you hear like, wait till you see the baby, there's gonna be this like emotional Shaktipad payoff kind of thing, like where you realize, ah, and you have this thing, and I didn't expect that to happen to me. It did mm -hmm. not happen to me. Um, but some of that comes from expectation. And, and so this idea that there is a place to get to, to experience it um, can get in your way. So I wouldn't and worry about that. And being self-critical when yeah. you're not experiencing it. Yeah, because listen, we're guys and we're not always that in tune with our emotions. That's just the way it is. Speak for yourself. I mean, you are very in tune <laughs> with your emotions. Um, and I think I am too, to a point, but like, but, and, so I'm with you, Dan. I think it's not always going to be right there for us, but I also understand what Rich is saying. It's it's a practice, and if it means you know every day trying to connect with really basic things, not necessarily I'm grateful for my wife, I'm grateful for my kids, I'm grateful for where I live, blah blah blah. That helps. That's nice. But even just as simple as um, I'm grateful for for that sunset or whatever. Eventually, you might get that that hit might come mm -hmm. and um and then then once it comes it just grows once you once that practice will just grow and um anyway that's all i can say yeah. does all that right, make cool. sense that makes sense all right i'll stop talking now let's go to kyle from massachusetts hey rich and adam my name is kyle stanley i'm from massachusetts and i'm a longtime listener of rich's podcast and my question revolves around the fact that I'm doing Ryan Holiday's Read to Lead Challenge currently, which is a paid course by Ryan Holiday where he teaches you how to read more efficiently and how reading can help improve your life, which I believe myself. The challenge for this week is to ask five people who you respect for a book recommendation that changed their lives. So you two are people that have already changed my life. So my question for you two is, what is a book in your life that has transformed or changed the way that you view the world or the way you act. Thank you, Kyle. Message received. Get I'm it. I'm currently sending it to, to my Cypher colleague. He's we'll sending the books. It. He's sending the books. <laughs> yeah, right. My answer to this is not that sexy, uh, but it's true for me. Um, the book that has changed my life the most, hands down, is the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't know if Kyle no. needs to read that book. Probably not. No. But maybe he does. Uh, if I'm being completely honest, like I could come with some sexy book, obscure title that would make me sound cool. But honestly, it's the big book. Changed my life more than any other book. And then second to that. What, can you describe the big book? Because I've not heard of it. It's basically, you've never heard of it? No. I'm sure you've seen it in various Starbucks with people sitting huddled over it. It's the Bible of Alcoholics Anonymous, okay. essentially, which lays out the 12 step program and has stories of people who have battled with and overcome alcoholism. And it's sort of the, you know, the guidebook and the centerpiece to the whole kind of 12 step architecture of, of Alcoholics Anonymous. Fair. Yeah. Um, so obviously that book changed my life, yep. continues to change my life. It's a book that I'm, I lit, it's not like a book I read and put down. It's like an operating manual right. for life. Right. Uh, this, the other operating manuals for life that have been incredibly transformative for me are also no surprise to anybody who listens to this podcast. The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield absolutely has been essential in helping me, you know, craft this, my professional life and how I think about and pursue creativity. Second to that, The Artist's Way by Julia Cameron, which is sort of a workbook way of unleashing creativity and kind of finding your voice. And a fourth, if none of those satisfy you, would be Autobiography of a Yogi by Paramahansa Yogananda, yep. which will blow your mind with tales of spiritual prowess and magical, mystical possibilities. Love it. You've read that book, haven't you? I have. I have. Yeah. In fact, I, uh, when I was doing early on in the LA yoga world, I was doing- That's right. I, I always forget about the LA yoga chapter of your life. Yeah. And one of the first, epi like the first features we did were kind of the history of yoga in LA. And so we focused on 
the 1920s era, which was Pomeranz Yogananda. And I went right. to the Self-Realization Fellowship in Mount Washington, which was right. his real house. The original. Mm -hmm. the, the OG. And we were supposed to, I was supposed to meet and talk to this particular monk uh, in a, the conference room, but I guess that had been booked out. And so he sat me down in, uh, in like by the fireplace and he goes, and he, when we sit down, he said, you know, Parmanansa Yogananda used to spend every evening here, or Yogi G or whatever you call them. He used to spend every evening here talking to whoever guests came by. And it said that sometimes when you sit here and talk for a while, you can actually feel his presence when you leave. And I'm like, yeah, sure. And so then I sat and had my interview with him and the guy was fine. Like, I didn't feel like, you know, you when you're speaking to some people who have like the spiritual connection, mm -hmm. you can feel it. I didn't feel anything special. But then when I left, it was like I was walking, like I walked out of the house, all of a sudden I was like walking on air. Like I felt so alive and like, you know, alive and high. And, mm. and, uh, and so I did have that feeling there. So That's that is trip, interesting. Yeah. And that- That's saying a lot coming from you being a natural born skeptic. Well, you know, it's- A recalcitrant. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a ma many layered lotus, yes. many petaled lotus. That's true. But that, uh, that lotus is just opening up. It's just opening it up. With every roll on episode. <laughs> this is my mission, Adam. Well, it's you funny that you blossoming should, and flowering. It's funny you should say that because my book, the book I'm thinking of is called Hua Hu Ching. It's the unknown teachings of Lao Tzu. It's a follow-up kind of like the lost scrolls of the Tao Te Ching. And I'm thinking of a moment. It was uh, in, I think in 1995, I was sitting on a bluff in Isla Vista overlooking the beach with my good friend and podcaster, Kelton Reed of the Writer Files a guy who I was a uh, screenwriting partner with when we were both trying to become writers, he, him right out of, of Boulder, uh, University of Colorado, and myself kind of trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And we were working for this like grind them to the bone uh, environmental group that we were out there kind of getting members for the Sierra Club or whatever, a summer canvassing, mm -hmm. like boots on the ground campaign work. Um, and it was like the summer, getting ready for the big summer canvas season. And I came up late. I was kind of bummed out. I'd been burned out. I've been working for this organization for like almost two years. And I was like ground to the bone of a lot of work, hard work and not feeling the reward. And he sits me there and I'm feeling like, I, I, I became friends with him up in Portland a few, few months before. And he hands me this book. I didn't know him well at the time. He hands me this book and I read it and I just get overwhelmed with that same feeling I got at Parmanahansa Yogananda from, from some reason, mm. this, this, lightness in my body it was almost like the only thing i can compare it to is like a psychedelic feeling like when it's coming on but i hadn't taken anything i hadn't drank anything and it was available to me and then the, for the next week we just spent the week kind of reading this book and on that beach sleeping on that beach illegally and just hanging out with a group of friends for that week and that book taught me to for the rest of that week, I was focused on positives. Everything that came at me was, I was misinterpreted. I was taking it apart and just bringing the positives to my life. And that's all I thought about. And that really was the beginning of me seeing life as a quest, as a quest for myself versus as a life to just, you do one thing, then you do the other thing. All of a sudden life became a quest. I started getting into like the esoteric Carlo Castaneda teachings of Don Juan books, mm -hmm. you know, and, and getting out into nature as, po as much as possible and feeling the power of nature. And, and that kind of set me up for everything. I think I could give you a million books I like better that, you know, amazing works of literature. Um, but that book, more than anything, kind of that moment changed everything for me. That's pretty powerful testimony. I feel inspired to read this book now. Look at that. Who's I making know. speeches on Rich I'm Roll's so podcast? inspired by you, Adam. See? <laughs> This lotus flower, those petals are opening up and the power that is emanating forth, the vibration, the yes. audio vibration going out into the universe. Look at you. See? Stepping I, into your own power. You see me as a skeptic? Yes. I am a little the bit of a The quest manifests. Yeah. Quest, baby. Life is a quest. I like it, man. And you got through that whole thing without dropping a Kerouac reference. But you kind of... There was an intuitive but kind Kerouac, of like reference to like an guys, on the road kind of vibe. Those guys Speaking were the of first. Questing, yeah, the beat poets. They were the ones that I know really your saw sweet it. spot. Yeah, they saw it as life. As but a it quest comes from modern life. The origin of that is you know, this yeah, yeah, the deeper of, stuff. Yeah, exactly. And then you know, since then, the Tao Te Ching is kind of a daily companion, or almost daily. So, mm. I think that was a solid roll on. Hey, thanks, man. Maybe I think that was too. Yeah. How do you feel? 
What's the title of this episode? Diggable Planets. That's good. That kind of brings it all into yes. one, doesn't it? Yeah. Um, let me just say, you look great. Thank you. You, I mean, you look Post-COVID. great. Post-COVID. Even better than before COVID. Look at you. COVID exuding, agrees with you. Exuding gratitude, empathy, thinking about others. I know. Look at you. What did you think I was? <laughs> but if you cut me off, I will revoke your motherfucking driver's license. Yeah. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Starting with Mathis. All right, let's end it. We'll see you back here in a couple of weeks. Thanks for taking a, this crazy roller coaster ride with us. Hope you guys had fun. And uh, we'll see you back here soon. Peace. Lights. Coyote. Coyote.